Hey everybody, Tom here, and today I want to teach you how to play Oath, Chronicles of Empire and Exile. This is a game by uh, the same publisher, I think by the same designer, and definitely the same artist as, basically it's the same team that brought us Root, which is super cool, awesome, asymmetrical game. This game kind of touts itself to be asymmetrical, but I don't know that I would really like uh, when you compare it to Root, it's not like <laughs> it's just not. Um, this is an everybody like this is a competitive game where everybody is playing against each other, but in this game there is one person who kind of um, is different than the other players. So in some senses you want to call it one versus all, but it's not really because it's everybody versus everybody. But anyway, I know that's kind of complicated. So we're gonna be jumping in to learn how to play Oath. I did a video, uh, well, okay, let me say this. This game is unique in that you can actually play this game as a kind of campaign, kind of legacy experience. The reason why I say it's kind of is there's no pre-scripted campaign that happens and like a campaign game, and there's no aspect of adding stickers or destroying stuff like a legacy game. But what this game is going to do is when you finish your first game, aspects of the way that stuff is set up is going to kind of carry over into your second game and then when you finish your second game you're going to save things and add things in a way that that gets you ready for your third game and so it's kind of like this rolling experience it's really unique now what I've done is I went ahead and set up the game uh, I did that in my setup video you could watch there's a link down here but this game has a really cool way that it comes to you in that as you're opening decks of cards, it teaches you exactly how to set up for your first game because your first game is going to set up rollovers into the other games. So I did a setup of the first game video. I'm now going to play the first game as I teach you how to play it. And then I'll do a third video where I show you how you would clean up your first game in preparation for your second game. So, and then I'm gonna set up a second game so that you can kind of see how this rollover thing happens. Along the lines of having a really scripted setup for your first game, this game has a scripted first turn, which I will use for the first round of the game. So my plan is, here in this video, I'm gonna teach you how the game is played, what's happening, all of that stuff. Because I found for myself that when I just followed the scripted first turns, I had no idea what was going on. So I am gonna go ahead and teach you the game like I would in any other video. And then I'm going to, as naturally sounding as I can, just follow the script that they've laid out for the, for the first play. Or I mean the first round, but I'm going to do it in a way that it just sounds like I'm making crap up off the top of my head. Like they literally walk you through each turn here and you can see it's quite a lot. So I'm going to walk you through the turns of the book, kind of using my own voice and my own anecdotes and stuff like that. And then from there, what will happen is, the rule book kind of says if you're not playing with the full complement of four players for the first game, after the first round, you can go ahead and remove the components for one of the players and continue. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna teach you the rules. We're gonna do the scripted four turns. Oh, you can't see there's a fourth purple player over here. So we got the chancellor and then we have three exile players. I'm gonna do the scripted first round, remove the yellow player. And then from there on, it's gonna just be me. Now a tricky part of this whole learning experience is the fact that the vocabulary is honestly really tough and there are some really unique ideas in this game so I can't really fall back on prior knowledge for some of the stuff. And because it's such a unique game, there are some elements that are gonna to be too tricky to learn right up front. If I tell you everything right up front, it's gonna be like, what is this video even doing? So a thing that I wish they had added to the game are some kind of markers. Um, specifically for battle, there's gonna be battles in this game, and I wish they had some kind of a way to mark stuff for battle. They don't. So as I learned the game, I found these were really helpful. So I'm gonna keep a bunch of these cubes nearby. But specifically, I need to remind myself that there's a lot of stuff I wanna teach you after a couple of rounds. And so my plan is I'm gonna teach most of the game, and then I'm gonna put this cube right here to remind myself that at the beginning of the fourth round, I wanna teach you the stuff that I haven't taught you yet. In my brain, 
I feel like that's how I would even play this if I was playing this with normal people and not just recording it. So that's kind of the plan. With that said, welcome to Oath. This is a beautifully artistic, cool looking game. Here's the land. Uh, I don't remember if it has a special name, but you can see that it's divided into three different regions. We have the cradle, which I kind of like to imagine the ruler of the land is hanging out over here. It's nice and easy to travel. We have the provinces, and then we're gonna have the hinterlands, which are kind of like the outskirts that are really hard to travel through. So you can see these regions. Each region has some sites. That's what these cards are here. So the cradle has two sites. The provinces have three, and the hinterlands have three. And currently we know what three of those sites are. These pawns right here, these big pawns, represent your character. So this is actually called the Chancellor. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, uh, this is kind of a one versus all, but really everybody versus everybody thing. But the Chancellor is a unique character in the game. Every game has to have a Chancellor. And so the Chancellor is basically the current ruler of the land who uh, got sick of the other people who weren't following him and kicked them out. Okay, that's one way to think of it. And so some things you're going to notice about the Chancellor are he has a player board here. You're going to notice a lack of a space called a revealed vision that all of the other players have. And you can see that all of the other players are also called exiles. So we have the Chancellor and then we have the red exile and you can see this revealed vision spot that the Chancellor doesn't have. Same thing with the blue player exile, revealed vision and our yellow player exile revealed vision. And you're also gonna notice that these exile characters start with, they have fewer of these banner tokens. These are called war bands. They have fewer of them. And uh, they're gonna start with three war bands. One of these tokens is called a secret. These coins are called favors. And you're gonna see that down here it looks a little bit different. So I guess what I'm trying to say is every exile is the same as the other exiles, just different colors. But the Chancellor is different and has some important differences. They have a lot more war bands. This part of the board looks different. They don't have a revealed vision. They're actually gonna start with two favors and a secret and then three war bands here. The numbers on this spot, this supply spot are different. They have this entire um, Imperial Reliquary board down here that the other players don't have. Whoever's playing the Chancellor will always start with this Grand Scepter. The Grand Scepter has to do with this board down here, and it's gonna grant this player some special powers. And so there's kind of all of these differences happening here. I'm gonna talk about a couple more in a second. But for the most part, all players have the same actions and the same turn structure, which are listed here. So, so this part of the board is the same as that part of the board over there for the most part. So you can kind of see here we have the Chancellor Pawn and then over here we have the Red Exile and the Blue Exile Pawn and over there is going to be the yellow one. But a couple other things that I want to show you is that the you could see that there are already war bands on the board, these banners over here. So not only does the Chancellor have a lot more, but they actually start with some of those on the board. And essentially what that is, is that's showing who currently rules a specific location. And so the fact that the purple player, the Chancellor, has two war bands in the plains, one in the mountains, one on the rocky coast, that's just showing who basically owns or who is ruling those specific locations. That's extra important because every game is going to have a unique, a unique, unique, um, what do you call this? Oath Keeper way to victory for the Chancellor specifically. So, I know that's kind of confusing. Let me see if I can explain this. Basically, in this game, you want to be the player who rules the most sites. And if you're doing that and you're the chancellor, um, you're kind of on a timer. You're basically, you're starting the game by ruling the most sites and you just want to hold on to that as long as possible until the end of the game. At the end of the game, if the chancellor rules the most sites, he's the winner. We'll talk more about that later. And then other players are trying to take down the Chancellor and rule the most sites so that they will also have the option to win. And we'll, we'll talk about that. It's, so it's kind of like we all have the same goals, but it's executed a little bit differently. But in this particular game, in this first game, we want to rule the most sites. 
And to rule the most sites, you need to have your war bands on a specific site. And, and like, if the red player were to end up ruling this, they would be the only player with war bands on that. You'll never have multiple players' war bands on anybody's site. So, so yeah, that's going to... Whoever has banners on that site, they rule it. You want to be the person that rules the most. That's the simplest way to think of how to win this game. So the reason why the Chancellor starts with this uh, marker here, this Oath Keeper marker, is because they currently rule the most sites. That's how the game was set up. And so currently, the Chancellor rules the Plains, the Mountains, and the Rocky Coast. And if the Oath Keeper can hold on to that title at the end of the game, even if they lose it during the game, basically, if they can hold on to that Oath Keeper title until the marker reaches over here, then if the game were to end here, they would be the winner. And if it were to end here, they would be the winner, and here they'd be the winner. The reason why this die is here is because it's always kind of boring to have just like a structured, this is exactly when the game's going to end. The game will have a maximum of eight points. If the Chancellor has the most sites, if they're ruling the most sites, so they have this placard in front of them, and we get to this round, what will happen is we would roll the die, and if it was a six, the game would end, and the Chancellor, who has the Oath Keeper thing, would be the winner. This is purple just to remind you that, that would, this die would only roll if the Chancellor had the Oath Keeper placard. If we got over here, we would need to roll it, and on a five or a six, if the Chancellor had this, then the game would end, and he would be the winner. Okay, so that only applies specifically to the Chancellor, is this timer over here. If they have that placard and the die is rolled when we get to these rounds, they would automatically win. So that's the goal of the Chancellor, to keep that Oath Keeper thing as long as possible, but specifically have it when that round token crosses those die things. Now, of course, it's a game. Other people are going to end up ruling more sites than the Chancellor throughout the game. If that were to happen, let's say, for example, the red player was to get this thing. If they end up ruling more sites than any other player, they get this token in front of them. What would happen is, they would earn this during their turn at some point, and if they keep this until the beginning of their next turn, then what they're going to do during this wake phase is that it's going to say, hey, red player, if you have this at the beginning of your turn, you're going to flip it over, and now you're no longer an Oath Keeper, you're a Usurper. And if they can hold on to this placard until their next turn, then they're going to win. So if you end up ruling more places than the Chancellor or than any other player, and you end up with this, you don't have to wait for the timer. You just have to hold on to that position, that position for two full rounds. If you can do that, you're the winner. So let me hand this back to the Chancellor. And again, just trying to get you used to this vocabulary. Chancellor just needs to be the Oath Keeper in those last couple of rounds. Any exile would want to be the Oath Keeper for two full rounds in order. Like, if they lose the placard, then they have to start again. But that's kind of what exile characters are trying to do. There will be a different way that the exile players can win, and it's with these things called visions that I want to talk about a little bit later, but just keep in mind that it's going to kind of mention that here. It says, exiles, you can win by being the usurper at the start of your turn. So that's what we were just really talking about at the end of each round. Or you can win by having a vision revealed that will give you a different um, victory condition. So with so much going on, just a quick recap of what you should know at this point. You should know that we have a player that's the Chancellor and then some number of players who are Exiles. In this specific game, because of the tile that was chosen, the way to victory is to rule the most sites. Ruling a site means that you have your Warband banners on those sites. So with that part established, let's kind of talk about what each turn would look like. In this game, there's kind of two, three, or four resources depending on how you look at it. The, the most basic resources are, you're gonna have these coins, which are called favors, or favor, and then you're gonna have secrets. So you can kind of imagine that you, as an exile, you've got money, but you're also holding on to the secrets of the people in the village. And so we've got favors and secrets. Those are the most basic types of resources, things you're gonna spend to do different stuff. But there's also kind of another type of resource that's called supply. 
supply is essentially going to help you take actions every turn. So while these things will pay for the actions, you have to imagine that like you have to execute those actions in the first place in order to pay for them. That's what the supply marker is going to do. So here we have a whole list of different actions that we can take during our turn. Every one of those actions is going to cost supply and they might cost favor and secrets. So keep that in mind. We're going to pick an action, spend a supply, and then we might need to pay some of these to also do those actions as well. We also kind of have this resource type thing of these war bands. And as I mentioned before, war bands are what's going to help us rule the sites. There are banners. It's how we're establishing ourselves in the community. And so uh, that's going to kind of be moved around by battling and mustering and stuff like that. So these are like troops that we're going to have in the game. We are also going to have our hand. Like this game doesn't play with a typical hand of cards in front of you. The cards that you have in front of you or that you're holding are going to be stored over here in the advisors section. Any card over here is called an advisor. Sometimes they'll be face up, sometimes they'll be face down. And what you can see right here is everybody has a limit of three cards. Face up or face down, advisors, limit of three over here. All right, so on a turn, you're going to have a starting number of supply. We're going to spend those supplies by taking actions. For some of these actions, we're going to need to pay coin and pay secrets, and we're going to be manipulating our warbands in order to rule various locations on the board. So again, the purple player rules this place because there are banners on it, even though we're standing over here in the mountains as well. We're trying to get to the point where we rule more locations than anybody else. Because if we can do that, we will be the Oath Keeper. And if we can be the Oath Keeper for two rounds, we'll win the game. Or if we're the Chancellor, if we're the Oath Keeper near the end of the game, we could win. So let's go through what some of these actions are. Again, just so you can get a feel. I know that I repeat myself a lot. I teach middle school math. I've learned the advantage of repeating. I recognize for some of you that's kind of annoying. Really sorry about that, but I want to get that vocabulary starting to go in our brain. All right, here's the different list of actions that we can take. And I actually don't think that the order that they're listed here is the best way to learn. And so I'm going to kind of jump around this list here. And in fact, do you know what I'm going to do? To help myself make sure I cover everything, I'm going to use these cubes like a big dork just to mark which ones I have talked about because I don't think that these are in a logical order for me. Okay, first thing I want to talk about is how to travel. We're going to need to move around this whole area for sure. So how do you move around? Well, it's going to cost one to four supply tokens. And the cost to move is actually printed above uh, each region. So from the cradle, the purple player could spend one supply in order to move within the cradle. So they just spend the one supply. They could move down here, reveal this site, and now we have two sites available. If they wanted to go to any of the locations in the provinces, they would need to spend two supply. And if they wanted to go two spaces away, so if they wanted to go all the way over to the hinterland, they would need to spend four supply. And by doing that, they could, they could go to any one of the locations here. Movement within the provinces is pretty simple. If you're here, it's two supply to move anywhere. So two supply to go this way, two supply to go this way. And again, you don't have to just move linearly. You can go to any of the locations over there or two supply to go anywhere up or down. Obviously, if we're going to try to rule places, maybe instead of fighting the purple player, it might just be good to just go open up these different locations and just rule these empty locations. The cost for traveling from the hinterlands is a little different. It's four supply in order to go all the way over to the cradle, two supply just to hop over to the provinces, and it's actually three supply to move within these spaces here. It's pretty tough to travel within the hinterland. So that's the cost of traveling. And that's how we're going to move around. It's just spend some supply, move around. One thing I did want to point out really quickly, it's easy, I think, to imagine that this is also a location. But no, the locations are the bigger cards. Basically, any cards to the side of it, that's going to be um, stuff that you would find within those locations. So let me bring this card up here just to talk about some of its anatomy. We're going to be able to battle over the rocky coast. And if we do, there's different numbers of um, defense that happens here. Okay. And you're going to see this little icon here. That's about bandits. We'll talk about that later. But if we were going to be fighting over the rocky coast, 
the person who owns or who rules the rocky coast would get one defense die. And then in terms of what can live at the rocky coast, there's two there's a two card limit. And so that stuff is going to end up two cards over on this side. All right. Every location also has a special ability. We'll talk more about those later. And some cards are going to start with resources on them or near them. That's up here in this top left corner. So when the mountain showed up, there's this, oh, let me bring it closer. There's this R. That means that there is a relic at the mountains, and that's what this card is doing over here. Okay. So Wahoo, one thing we can do on our turn is we can travel. Another thing we could do is we could search for stuff. We could search for more advisors. We could search for, I don't know, maybe we'll find uh, other villagers to help us out. So searching is kind of unique and everything is described right here. But basically there's always gonna be two places you can search. You can always search from the general uh, draw pile here. This is called the world deck. You can always draw from here. And the cost to draw from here depends on how far into the game we are. We'll talk more about this marker uh, during the game. But yeah, basically for right now, it would just cost two supply to search, but later on in the game, it's gonna cost three, and then eventually it will cost four. And anytime you search, what you do is you draw three cards into your, into your non-hand, but you basically you pull up three cards, and we'll talk about that more later, but you're going to end up discarding two and keeping one. You're also going to see some discard piles in each of the three regions. Um, and so the purple player also could choose to search cards that are at the cradle. Currently, the red player and the blue player could search cards that are over here in the provinces. The yellow player could search cards that are over here in the hinterlands. And same as before, uh, they would always cost two, no matter what, to, to search from here. That's what that icon is telling you. So you could draw three cards and then you you will definitely discard two. You could keep one card to play or to save. We'll talk more about that. We'll talk about mustering a little bit later. Something we could do while we're in a location is we could try to trade with the people there. So kind of a really interesting thing that this game does is it really utilizes the villagers of each of these locations. So right now we have these people. These are, oh, you can't see it. There are basically six factions in the game, six different groups of people that are kind of spread throughout. And so you can kind of see this arcane faction. The reason I'm pointing to arcane is this icon right here is also seen on this card. So the arcane people are here in the mountains. And what we could do is we could try to trade with them. Now I won't get in, into too many details here because we'll talk about it later, but essentially the idea is that you could tell a secret to this faction and they will in turn from this part of the board give you some money or let me reset that oh you could instead uh pay them some money it would actually cost two to do this you could actually pay this arcane faction some money in hopes of gaining a secret and something kind of fun and thematic about this is you're going to end up with cards over here with some advisor cards. And if we had an arcane, one of those triangle, if we had one of those cards in front of us, it would actually boost our ability to trade. So if we had some of this arcane faction with us, when we try to make a trade with those people at a location, it's actually going to be for our advantage. So we'll keep an eye on that. So something you could do is you could trade in coins for secrets and you could trade in secrets for coins. And that's all gonna have to do with the type of people that are at those locations. Okay, so let's trade. We could also try to recover relics that are at those places. So we've talked about recovering a little bit, but basically down here, because there was a relic put on this location, then I could actually pay some coins in order to pick up the relic that's hidden at this location. And relics will give each player like a really cool special ability. You can also use this recover action to gain one of these banners, but I really don't wanna talk about the banners until we get a couple of rounds in the game just because it can feel a little overwhelming. Next, something we can do is we can muster where we are. What that means is that we can place a coin on one of these cards we could basically pay one of these factions and i should also say these cards they're in general are called denizen cards i guess that's like a different word for citizen but basically we could pay 
money to one of these factions in order to muster some help. So by paying a coin, we would be able to get two more warbands to join us as we're moving around. And that's the muster action. Finally, we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but there's the campaign action, which is basically their fancy word for saying kind of that we're attacking. And we can essentially attack other players with the goal of ruling different locations. You can even attack players with the goal of taking relics away from them. You could attack other players to try to take money away from them, stuff like that. So that's what campaign is. It's pretty complicated, so I'm gonna hold on to that a little bit later. But for now, let me just go ahead and do a quick reset. Make sure that I've got my exiles where they belong. And you can see all of those actions are all listed there. Those are all actions that would require you to spend some supply. You can take as many of those actions in any order you want to. You could do them several different times as long as you have supply to spend. And then there's gonna be some minor actions that don't cost any supply. We'll talk about those later. So that is the very broad brush overview of what's happening. In this specific game, we wanna rule stuff. The Chancellor already rules a lot of the land. We've all been exiled. We're gonna try to get back in there. We're gonna try to build support see if we can rule some of these locations in order to win the game. Another big important concept, I, I know I said it in my setup video, let me make sure that I say it here too in case I forgot. Our pawns are gonna be moving to these different locations and one thing that's really gonna help is to imagine that the red player is currently in the mountains and anything else they have over here on their board on their board is with them. So these aren't necessarily with them, but if it's on the board, it's with them. So the red player currently has three warbands marching around with them. They have this advisor who's also hanging out with them, and that advisor might end up staying in the mountains or it might move around, we're gonna see. And this red player currently knows one dark secret from somebody, and they have one coin. So, that will just help conceptualize some of this stuff. If it's on the board, that means it's physically with you in whatever location you're at. So with the really broad overview done, you shouldn't know specifics yet. I just want you to have a feel for some of the vocabulary, some of the goals, and some of the characters. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump into the pre-scripted rule book, how the very first turn of the first game should go. I'm gonna try to do it in a way that doesn't sound like I'm scripting anything out. I'll just talk my way through what the rule book is telling us to do but that's what I'm gonna do. So from the purple player through the yellow player, all of these decisions were already made for us. So the Chancellor will always take the first turn of the game. And we always start by doing the wake action, which essentially the wake action is kind of like saying, like, do, did we meet the requirements for winning the game? This is basically what this is always gonna be. This specific one is reminding us to check the people's favor, which is the banner that I haven't talked about yet. So we're just gonna ignore that wake phase for a little while. And so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna act. So I'm gonna spend my supply in order to take these different actions. There's really not a wrong way to go here, but what we will do is we're gonna go ahead and search, see if we can get some more cards into our hand. Remember your hand is essentially the face up and face down advisors we have over here, a limit of three. When we search, we could either search the discard pile for the region where we are. So since we're here, we could search this discard pile and pay two. Or right now, we could pay two to search this pile. I'm gonna go ahead and spend two in order to search the world deck, the main draw pile. And what happens is, oh, I guess I should do this. You always draw one card at a time because there are some cards with a slightly different back they're called vision cards, we'll see those later. So we're just gonna draw one at a time to make sure we don't hit a vision. So there's card number two and card number three. You always draw three and you can always look at those three and we're gonna discard two of these cards and we're gonna keep one that we could either play immediately or we could just store it. So looking at these, uh, we have a garrison, we have a faithful friend and we have a fire talkers. I think what we're gonna do, and, and we will kind of talk about what's happening on the bottoms of these cards in a second. Really quick overview. Um, this card will help in battle, that's what that icon means. And you could spend a secret to help you in battle in order to help you as an attacker or as a defender. That's why this is purplish. 
this card right here would have to be played in your advisor pile. That's what this icon is saying right here. You would have to play this in the advisor's pile and you would gain four supply for doing that. But this guy is a faithful friend. He's going to be with you forever. That's what this chain is. Again, lots of iconography and stuff to talk about. We'll get that later. What we're going to do is we're actually going to keep the garrison. So the garrison it has to do with the order faction. It has this icon, which means that when we play it, it has to get played to a location, the site where we are. And this one has a when played effect. It says when played, gain one warband per site that you rule and put one warband from your board on each site you rule. So we're really trying to hold on to control of these places, so that's why I think the garrison is the best way to go. So let me just hold on to this for a quick second. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be keeping this card, but let's talk about discarding. So these two cards are gonna get discarded, and because everything else in this game is so complicated, not only, like discarding is also complicated, you never discard to the to the pile of the matching region. You always discard to the spot on your right, or if you're discarding from the hinterlands, you would discard to the cradle. So because we are over here in the cradle, we're gonna discard to the provinces. Thematically, it's almost like saying, oh, we're too good at the cradle for those cards. So we're gonna pass them down to the provinces. And if we were in the provinces, oh, we're too good for these. We're gonna give them to the hinterlands. And then I don't know how my analogy works, but yeah, people at the hinterlands would discard to the cradle. Pretend like it makes sense. Now with the card that we're keeping, we have a couple of options. We could just hold on to it in our hand and keep it face down and save it for later. That's one of the options that we've got. We could, if it was not this garrison card, play it in our advisors face up and it would be a, a card, a person who's gonna stick with us um, as we move around and they would be a loyal advisor to us. Or we could play this to the site where we're located and specifically because this card has this tree icon, whenever we choose to play it, it has to be played to the site. That's what that tree is telling us. So I could, essentially with this specific card, I could choose to just keep it face down and save it for a rainy day. Or I could choose to play it, which would mean it would have to go to a site. I am gonna go ahead and play it to the site. And so this is gonna go right here. We're still good because this site has a three card limit and we're only at two cards so far. We're gonna deal with this when played ability here in a second, but something else you need to know about any time you play a card onto a site, you're really helping the people there. You're giving them jobs, it's a good thing. So what you'll do is we're gonna go find the coin stack or the favor stack for this specific faction. So right here, I'm just matching the icon and they're gonna pay us one coin for having given them employment. Money is really interesting in this game because like we, the exile players start with one coin, we started with two, there's this coin on the banner up here, and then each of these spots started with three coins. Coins are a really limited resource in this game. Like beyond the coins that I just pointed out, for the most part, no coins are going to enter the game with a few exceptions. But for the most part, we only have these coins that we're gonna be moving around from one spot to the other. It's rare that we'll bring new coins into this closed economy. That's not the same for secrets. Secrets are gonna come and go, no big deal. But that's, that's an important thing to know about coins. So for the most part, whenever you're gonna be spending a coin or picking up a coin, it will, it will a lot of times have to do with the, the type of card that, that, that's related to that coin. So we just built some garrisons and this faction is helping us. They're excited, so they're gonna pay us a favor. Now this specific card had a when played thing. And remember, this says that we're gonna gain one warband per site that we rule. As I've said a few times in this video, we rule three sites right now, the three starting sites. And we're gonna put one warband from your board on each site that you rule. So if we're going the long way, we rule three sites. So we're gonna grab three warbands, put them here. And then we're gonna take those warbands and put them on the sites that we rule. Obviously the fast way is grab one from here and put them on the sites. So there's one, two, three. And again, you can kind of imagine these warbands as like good defense. We hold this place, we're gonna defend it. And that's what the warbands are doing. Oh man, all of that, and we're still on the first turn of the game. We've only done one action, but we have plenty of supply to go. So the next thing I think we're gonna do is we're gonna make a trade. 
Now trades would, if we had this card face up in front of us, would utilize uh, the suit of these cards, the order of these cards. Uh, but this is still face down, so we're going to ignore that for a second. It won't matter also because of what we're about to say. But take a look at what this says. So we're going to trade on an empty card at your site. So here's our site. We're going to pick a card that doesn't have anything on it already. I'm going to pick the garrison card. And I could either put a secret down, gain one coin, plus one coin per matching advisor. So if I had more order uh, cards that were face up, that would help me gain more coins. Or I could place two coins on that card and gain one secret per matching advisor. Well, like I said, I don't have a matching advisor over here. So I'm going to go ahead and place a secret on the garrison. And you'll see why a little bit later, but we will get this secret back. And in return for me telling them their secret, they're actually going to pay me a coin. And again, if I had more cards over here that were the order suit, I would have gotten even more coins. And as will happen in this video, that costs one supply. Next, I'm going to go ahead and search. And right now, any search just costs two supply because of the state of the game. So I'm going to go ahead and spend two in order to search the main deck. So I'm going to draw three cards. And looking at these three cards, let's just do a quick overview of what each one would do, just as we're kind of learning. So there's the Inquisitor. This is the Arcane Faction. This actually would let us, if we had this card down, there would be an action available, the cost of a coin, to peek at an advisor of a different player who is at your site. Okay, we'll talk about the other stuff later. Uh, okay, the old oak card has a tree, so it would have to be played to a site. And this would actually help with one of your actions. This is the, uh, oh, this is the trade action. That's what that icon is saying. So if we had this as an advice, or we can't have it as an advisor because it's this. But if this tree were out and we were at this site when we traded, it says if trading with the old oak, whoa, with the old oak for one secret, gain one more secret if you have any of these advisors as well. So that's that one. And we actually do have, remember down here, we do have the forest path. So that could be a good card for us. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna stick with the errand boy. <clears throat> this errand boy is gonna help us with our searching. And it would cost a coin, but it says you may draw from a discard pile in a different region than yours. Because remember, you can always draw from the deck or from the discard pile of your region. And then we're gonna discard cards to the next region over. We're gonna go ahead and keep errand boy. So let me just put this here for a second. These two I don't want. We're currently here, so we're going to discard over there. And I've decided I want to keep the Aaron boy around me. So rather than playing him to the site where other people would be able to utilize this action, I want to keep the Aaron boy close to me. I could choose to keep it face down and make this decision about playing it there or here later, but I'm going to actually go ahead and just play it face up. So face up, I've got this Aaron boy here. I, only, I have a limit of three cards. I'm only at two, so that's good. And from here on out, if I'm doing the search action and I pay a coin to this faction, then, well, yeah, we'll talk about that later. It would eventually go to that faction, but that would let me draw from a discard pile different than the one that I'm at. That I'm at. All right, I've got two supply remaining. I think I'm gonna go ahead and spend one of those supplies to travel, so let me pay that. I'm here in the cradle. I'd like to know what this other location is. So I'm paying the one so that I could travel down here. Whenever you travel, you're gonna go ahead and reveal the site. This is the Lush Coast. We'll talk about these special abilities later. This one had to do with attacking, which is why I didn't talk about it yet. But here we are, we found the Lush Coast. First thing we do when we flip one over is see if there's anything else we need to put out. There is nothing here, so we're good. And if you ever need or want, there is a reference for what all of the different sites do. We're looking at one of the coasts. There's a couple different ones. And that was the icon we saw. So we'll try to remember when traveling from here to a coast site, the travel cost is one supply and you would ignore the narrow pass or whoa, the narrow pass power. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but basically if we're going from one coast to another, we could just spend one which is important to keep in mind because take a look, we got the rocky coast over here. So those are kind of connected, you can imagine. We haven't talked much about minor actions that don't cost points. 
for the most part, that's basically just like playing or discarding cards that you have face down in front of you or using actions that are on cards. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually take this face down card that's right here. We kind of looked at it a little bit earlier. It's the Forest Paths card. You could see that this card would help with travel if one is willing to spend a coin. And what it says is you would spend no supply and ignore the powers of the site if you're traveling to a site that has one of these cards uh, on it already. So I'm actually going to play this. I could play it in front of me, but I'm going to choose to play it on the site. And any time you're playing a card to a site, you're going to get a coin from that group of people. So we just got one from this group, which is the Beast group. Now that I have an advisor that matches the beast card, let's do a trade action. So the trade action always costs one supply. It's my last supply that I have. I don't have any secrets to spend right now, but secrets are nice. I like them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the one where I gain a secret. So I'm going to go ahead and place two coins on that group. Whoops. So two coins here. And from the supply, like I talked about before, coins almost always stay within that closed economy of being from the board. But from this one, we're going to grab secrets. They come from the main supply over here. So two here, and we get one secret per advisor that matches that suit. And at this point, I'm all the way out of supply. I don't even have any more cards to really do any minor actions for. If there were more cards over here that said action, then I could probably use those to do some minor actions. I can't even use this card to take an action because it's not an action card. It enhances the search action and I definitely don't have the supply to search. So at this point, I'm out of supply, no more minor actions to do. So I'm basically just gonna call it and we rest. The way the resting works is all of the coins that are on cards on the board go back to the little piles of the matching factions. So these are gonna go with the beasts. And any secrets we shared, remember, they're secrets, we still know what they are. So we're going to bring those back. And then what we're going to do is we're going to refresh our supply. That's what it explains right here. We basically need to count how many of these warbands we have. So we got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. So the, count the number of warbands that are over here. And that's going to tell us how much supply we get for next round. So we're going to go right here. Just for a quick second, let's imagine that our supply token had ended here. Or heck, maybe no, we won't talk about it. Yeah. If we had extra supply left over we didn't want to spend, normally we would have refreshed to here, but we had one extra supply that does carry over to here as needed. Alright. So that is going to be the end of the Chancellor's turn, which brings us to the red exile character. Again, as an exile, we would love to start ruling some of these locations, but the purple player is pretty strong right now. We're going to need to spend some time building up a, an army before we can really be effective in our attacking. I know that the purple player was discarding a bunch of stuff into the provinces, so I, see, I think the first action that we're going to do is we're going to take the search action. And currently all searches are just to supply, uh, but that will change eventually. But even when it does change, we're still going to always pay two supply to search from a discard pile. So just like we talked about before, we're going to bring three there. Oh yeah, three cards back, which we would take one at a time, keeping an eye out for some vision cards that we'll talk about later. Uh, before I look at these cards, just a quick peek. Okay, so we have a beast card that would have to stay with us as an advisor. That's what that icon means. And that one is going to help us with the muster action. So that's exciting. Okay, so we're not going to flip that over just yet. But we're going to look at these three cards. Okay, so we have Faithful Friend. We've talked about that one before. We have the Inquisitor. We briefly talked about that one. Basically, you can pay a coin. You'd peek at other people's advisors. Or we have the Old Oak, which would have to go to our current location. And if you do that, when you make a trade action, it's going to help you out with the trade action. So I think what we're going to do is let's go ahead and keep the old oak. So let me put this here for a quick second. We're going to discard these to the next region over. And with most cards, well, any card you could choose to just hold into your hand, hold on to in your hand here in your face down advisor spot. Or most cards you'd be able to also play face up, make it an advisor. But not this one. This one has to go to a site 
let's do go ahead and play this at the mountain site. So because we're kind of building this here at this location, uh, we're gonna have access to it by being here and uh, the beast faction is gonna pay us uh, for putting that there, they're happy about this. So we'll grab a coin from them and add it to our supply. Keep in mind, the mountains can hold a total of two cards. That's full. Neither of these cards really look discardable. There might be effects that let you discard cards, but for the most part, that's what's gonna be at the mountains. So that was a search action. I think what we're gonna do next is we're gonna go ahead and as a free action, we're gonna reveal our animal playmates card. This has to be played to our advisor spot. It couldn't go onto the board. And as we, oh, did I read this before? I don't remember. But when I take the muster action, it says that I would spend no supply if you're mustering on a card that's also a beast card. We'll talk about that in a second. So that's gonna go right there. I don't gain a coin from just playing to my advisors. We're not helping the greater good of the beast faction. But we're gonna kind of use these two cards that we just played to play off of each other a little bit. Let's take a trade action next so that I can use that old oak. Remember when you trade, your card can't have anything on it yet. It's an empty card at your site. Your site means the site that you're standing on. And then we're either gonna turn in one secret to gain some coins or turn in two coins to get some secrets. We're gonna go ahead on this one and turn in two coins. We're putting it on the old oak to show that we're using it. And the old oak says, if you're trading with the old oak, which we are, then, oh, so four secrets, which we are doing now, we're trying to gain secrets, then we're gonna gain one more secret if we have any of the fox or the, the beast advisors, which we do have. So normally we would have just gotten the one secret for the one animal playmates card, but this time, because we're also doing this with the old oak, we're gonna gain two secrets. We've got a lot of secrets over here. Next, I think we're gonna do another search action. We're still in that part of the game where every search action is gonna cost two supply. Ooh, do you know what? I'll annotate it. I think I forgot to do one for the trade because I started here, I did two for my first search, one for the trade, and then two more for this next search. And I'm gonna go ahead and draw from the deck. So remember, you should draw one at a time just in case one of those special cards comes up, but we need three. And hey, look, this is one of those special vision cards. So we have to stop here. We're gonna take this one back, uh, bring it back with us. And before we even look at this, just so I don't forget, as soon as a vision is drawn, you move this marker up once, and now it's gonna cost three to search from this deck here. Now we're gonna look at these the same way we did before. We're gonna be able to keep one and decide what we wanna do with it. We'll talk about the visions in a second. Okay, so first option is we have an alchemist. This is part of the arcane faction. And for the cost of two secrets, we'll talk about why these icons are different a little bit later. Then we can access this action, which would gain us four from the bank in any of the favor banks. Bank, or, yeah, so we're gonna get four coins from the different banks up here and we could choose how we grab those. Or we have a vision card. So a vision card is basically a different way that exile people can win the game. I don't just have to conquer play, or I don't just have to rule places, I could do this a different way. So if I choose to keep this card, what I could do is I could either put it face down so that nobody knows what it is, or I could reveal my vision, putting it right here, and I would have a different way to win the game. So this one says, if drawn from the world deck, increase the visions drawn, we did that. And then exiles can play this face up in their revealed vision space. We just talked about that. Okay, this is saying during the wake phase, the very first part of the game, during the wake phase, you win if you rule the most sites and at least three visions have been drawn from the deck. So rather than like, you know how the exiles normally in this game, we would have to rule the most sites and then wait two full turns in order to declare victory. This one's gonna be like a shortcut. If we have this card here and we rule the most sites, that's a victory. I like that I know that this vision is here, but I'm instead gonna go ahead and keep the alchemist. So let me put this here for a second. We're gonna discard this. Since we're in the provinces, we're gonna put this in the hinterlands. It's a little scary that people know that there is a vision card right there. So the yellow player might be tempted by that. We'll see. What I've decided to do is I'm going to go ahead and keep this card. Well, you could either play it face down and then decide what to do with it later. I could play it, well, I couldn't play it face up in the mountains because the mountains are full, but I'm gonna go ahead and play it face up as one of my advisors. Again, later on, I'll have more space for this. But now there is an action that only I have access to. 
which is cool. So this action is now available to me to basically sell some secrets. And heck, why not? It doesn't cost any supply. I've got lots of secrets. Let's do that now. So the way this works is I need to spend two secrets. One of them I'm going to put on this card and it will come back to me at the end of the turn. And one of them is going to get burned. It's going to basically go into the general supply. So these two secrets would go here, but one of them is going to get burned and go to the general supply. But now I get four coins from any of the banks. We will kind of, you'll see as time goes on, the consequences from grabbing from different people. But we're going to go ahead and grab from Discord, one from Arcane. We're going to take one from Order, so now that one's empty, and one from Nomad. I could have taken a several from the same bank. I could have just totally pulled all of the money off of one of them, but we'll, we'll stick with it this way. Next up, I'm going to take the recover action. Now, if this wasn't part of the scripted part, I really wouldn't do this action, but it is part of the scripted part, so we're going to do this. We're going to recover. That's going to cost one supply. And what I'm going to do is, remember the recover action could help you get uh, a relic. So for example, I could go ahead and recover from here and to get this relic. In fact, as a free action, we could see what this relic is. This is the ivory eye. As an action, it would let you peek at any face down site, advisor, or relic at a site. Cool. Okay. But we're not going to actually grab that one. What we're going to do instead is we're going to grab this banner of the people's favor. So we will talk about the banners in more detail later on. But for now, let's grab this. And I'm trying to be careful here. <clears throat> Take a look. For the recover, in order to recover this card, we have to put more coins on here than the old number of coins. We're going to put the old coins in the favor banks one by one starting with any suit. So we're going to we're going to have to lay them out in order, but we would get to start where we put that. So I'm going to put this right here. In order to get this, I have to put at least two coins on it, and that's what I'll do. So we're going to put two on there, and then we're going to take the old coins and we're going to put them in one of these. And since I'm pretty good friends with the Beast Clan, we're going to go ahead and just give them that coin. If there were more coins, we would start with the Beast maybe and then add down the line kind of like that. And now I have this banner of the people's favor, which is, we'll, we'll talk about it later, but it will have this wake effect. So I'm going to put this up here just so that I can remind myself that I need to do this when, I, when we have the wake effect. And it's going to help me in my searching actions. So now any coins, any secrets, stuff like that needs to get cleaned up. So we're going to go ahead and grab this secret, put it here. Oh, I'm resting. That's what I should have said. These two coins were here with the beast, so they're going to come back to the beast. You can see they've got quite the stack going on here, whereas the order is totally empty. Now I need to count how many warbands I have. Let's see, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11. So normally we would refresh to here. But I had one extra supply left over, so we're going to be able to bump ourselves up all the way to the maximum. So before we move to the blue player, just a quick reminder here. Other people could take this from me. If they, the, the way they would do that is take the recover action, and they would have to have at least three coins to put on there. And then they would take it, but then they're going to also have to deal with the wake action. That We'll talk about that. Here, let's just talk about it really quickly. Basically, if you have this to keep people happy, oh, why won't that focus? Focus, my friend. Uh, hold on, hold the phone, maybe. There we go. When we do the wake action, it's, it says you must put coins here or you have to move coins, uh, or you have to move coins here to the favor bank with at least, with the least amount of coins, then, oh my gosh, why am I even reading this? I'm struggling. Then if this banner has six plus, we're going to flip it. So we're going to have to start feeding coins into this. Um, we're going to keep the people's favor. Otherwise, we're going to lose it. Oh, man. I can tell that it's time to go to the blue player's turn because I'm struggling with the focusing. All right, the blue player. The first thing they're going to do is they're going to use one of these secrets to use the action of the card at the site that they're at. Any card that says action. Uh, okay, what do I want to say? <clears throat> to use an action. You either have to be at the site or you need to rule the site. So this card here could be used by the blue player or the red player, or because the purple player rules it, they also could use that on their turn. So to use that, we're going to pay here. I'll bring the card closer. We're going to pay the one secret. And what this tells us is that we're going to discard either a beast or a, oh, what is that? Nomad card from your site to gain two favor from the matching favor bank. So let me go ahead and put that there. 
and take a look. We do have coins at both of these factions banks. And the card that we're discarding is from the side. So remember I said that for the most part these things can't just be discarded, but sometimes you can. And so what we're going to be doing is discarding this one. Because we're discarding from here, it's going to go over there into the hinterlands. That was a beast card, and so we get two coins from the bank from the beast from the beast bank. And doing actions doesn't cost any supply. That's one of the minor actions that you can use. Use action card. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to search. I want to search from the draw pile, and so I'm going to spend one, two, three supply to do that. And again, the reason I'm spending three supply is because uh, the vision marker is right here. So one at a time, I'm going to draw one, two, and there's a vision card. So we're going to have to stop anyway once we draw that vision, but that is our third card. If that had been the first or the second card, we also would have had to stop. But we're going to immediately go ahead and bump this thing up, bring these back. And let's take a look at what they are. We have the long lost heir. What this means is that it's gonna be, <clears throat> whoa, if you choose to keep it, you could either obviously always keep cards face down in your advisors until you're ready to play. But when it is played, it would have to be played as an advisor. And this means that you can't just get rid of it. You would be stuck with that card, is what the chain link means. And what this says is when played, if you're, uh, if you're in exile, you may become a citizen. That's something that we're gonna be talking about later. Um, citizenship here. Um, take no relic and, oh, well, take no relic and your act phase and refresh the supply to full. So if we wanted to become a citizen, and we'll talk about the pros and cons of that a little bit later, that card would help us do that. Okay, Roving Terror. Discard a denizen card. Remember, these cards are denizen, not this one. These are denizen cards. Okay, so we could pay a secret to use the action to disc discard a denizen card at any other site and then move this card there. Okay. And then we have this vision card, which remember is like an alternate uh, victory condition for the exile players. This one is vision of sanctuary. And again, instructions here that just says, if you draw, increase the vision, um, and then exiles can play this face up. All right, this says, during your wake phase, you win if you hold the most relics and banners, and at least three visions have been drawn from the deck. So these visions, if we choose to keep this and play it face up, if we, are, if we start our turn with the most relics and the most banners, banners are the ones like this, then we could, we, we would, win. well, we would win. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep this, but especially because there aren't three visions shown yet, I don't want people to know exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm going to keep this card and put it face down on my advisor uh, pile over there, and then we'll discard these two. And of course, discarding over here to the hinterland because we're in the provinces. And the next thing I want to do is another minor action. Minor actions usually have to do with, you know, you're using actions on cards. I want to reveal one of my cards, and I'm going to reveal my naysayers card. So this has to be played face up as an advisor. It could not go to a site. And when we rest, this says, uh, if any exile is the oath keeper or the usurper, take a coin from the chancellor. So we're going to go ahead and put this here. As of this moment, nobody else is um, the Oath Keeper. Nobody, nobody has the most sights at this point, but there it is if by chance that ends up happening in this game. Next up, I'm going to do another minor action, which would be that I want to actually peek at the relic at our site. We've already looked at it, but just to refresh our memory. So again, that's a free action to just look at it. Uh, so the, uh, sorry, the ivory eye, that's going to let us peek at any face down site, advisor, or relic at a site. So I think what I want to do is our vision is telling us that we want the most, the, a combination of the most relics and banners. So I'm going to want that relic. So I'm going to do the recover action. That'll be one supply. The cost to recover here, let me slide this off, is down here in this corner, so to recover from this site, we would have to spend two coins, but these don't just stick around in the in internal economy that we talked about. The, the broken coins there means that you actually remove those coins from the game. So I'm gonna go ahead and take these two coins, and they go to the bank. And that allows me to pick this up, and we've got it. So, as an action, I could spend a secret to peek at any face down site, advisor, or relic at a site. 
And that's not just for me. That's like for for other players, obviously. Like I could peek at the sights on the board. If I knew that somebody else had a face down vision and I wanted to see what it was, I could use that to see what that is. All sorts of stuff. But it is going to cost a secret. I think from here, let's do a little bit of traveling. So just because because we're at the provinces, it's going to cost two to travel no matter where we are or where we're going. And again, I know that because of these icons here. I'm going to travel down to this site here. So let's flip this up. Okay, so we have the salt flats. And what I need to do is I need to put two favor tokens and a secret on there. And you might wonder, why would you be putting those things on the location? Well, it's gonna to have to do with this special ability that we'll look up in just a second, but we're actually gonna bring these in from the bank and they just go right on here. And let's just take a quick look at our guide to see what that icon means. That says, at the end of your wake phase, so I can't do it right now, if your pawn is here, you may take one favor or one secret from this site. So we'd have to start our turn here. So I'm gonna guess that I'm probably gonna end my turn at this point. Uh, place so that I can take advantage of that next time. So I think I have a pretty good setup for myself for the future. At this point I'm going to go ahead and rest. So I've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11. So normally I would reset to here, but I do have one more supply. So I'm going to go ahead and reset my supply all the way to the left hand side. Remember, you'll always check the cards, not necessarily the locations, but these cards to make sure that if there are any coins or secrets, you need to put them where they belong. Secrets always come back to you. And that's the end of the blue player's turn. Now, here we are for the one and only yellow player's turn. As I mentioned before, we're still in the scripted round. And then once I finish this round, I'm going to go ahead and remove the yellow player from the game and just continue with the blue and the red player. I think I'll have enough on my mind. I don't need to juggle four characters in a complicated game. But they're going to do a little bit of a mustering action here. So to muster, it's going to cost one supply. And then we're going to pick an empty card at our site, put two coins on there, and then gain a warband. Oh, sorry, I said that wrong. Place one coin and take two warbands. Sorry, I said that backwards. So we're going to go ahead and grab these two. Let's put a coin up here. And again, we're using the elders to muster, which means because there's something on here, I won't be able to use this card to do an action. When you're taking actions that have you putting things on cards, that can only happen once. So if I really wanted to do this action, I would do the action instead of mustering. But yeah, by placing that coin, that allowed me to grab two warbands. Next up, I'm going to just do a minor action and reveal this card. It's a small favor, and it says, when played, gain four warbands. So obviously the yellow player is going to cause a little bit of trouble. By placing it here, it's actually locked in place, and it has to be played in front of me right there. But when played, you're going to gain four warbands. So, ooh, yellow player is ready. We're probably going to do some combat here, which is intimidating because it's a lot. Next up, I can see that I have a lot of warbands. I'm up to nine at this point. And the, I mean, sure, there's two warbands on these sites, but they're only going to get stronger and stronger. So let's go ahead and campaign in order to try to take out these warbands and take control of an area. I want to rule one of these areas. Now, just a heads up, this is not the first time I've tried to record this campaign because this is so complicated. I don't know why they made this part so complicated, but I'm going to do my very best to show you how to campaign. Just be aware that every single time you're gonna wanna probably use, the first couple times you play this game, use this campaign summary on this guide, cause look at all of these freaking steps that we are gonna have to go through. And even though I was following the steps, I kept missing some stuff. So here we go. I want to campaign against the chancellor. So campaigning is gonna cost two supply. So first thing you gotta do, spend your supply, cause we're about to spend a while doing this and it's easy to forget. Next, we have to choose a defender. Now, this is kind of interesting. The way you choose your defender is you just look at whatever pawns are at your site. So let's pretend the red one was here just for an example. You're choosing one of the pawns on the site or the warband color. So I can either choose to attack the red player or the purple player in this example, even though the purple pawn's not here. Because they have warbands, they are a viable target. Obviously, the red player really wasn't here, so the only option is I'm going to declare the purple player as the defender. And then once you've declared a defender, 
you actually have to pick targets. What things, <clears throat> what things exactly is it that you're targeting? Now, if you're attacking on a site that you don't rule, so we are picking the purple player, they're the defender, and they rule this site, we have to attack the site first and foremost. But there's other stuff that we could attack too that the purple player has that might be of interest. Now remember at the beginning of this video, oh man, that was so long ago, I talked about how the stuff on your player board is basically stuff that you're moving around with you. The reason I'm pointing that out is because if the purple pawn was here too, we would have more options than we do right now. Let's keep him here just for the example of what stuff we could target. So assume that the purple player was here at our site. Some other things we could attack beyond just attacking the site are we could try to take artifacts or we could try to take, sorry, relics away from people. Things that you can target will have a defense die number on it. So you can kind of, you've been seeing these little shields up here. That's stuff that you could attack in the right circumstance. So I could try to take the Grand Scepter away from the Chancellor, but it's really tricky. You could see that this has five defense dice. So that's pretty intense. We even could attack the Chancellor himself, which would help uh, remove some of their money. If they had too much money, attacking them would be a good way to get rid of some of their money. And I'm going to point this out because this is one of the things I forgot last time I recorded this, is that this guy is the Oath Keeper, and I'm going to need to remember that because he's the Oath Keeper, he's a little tougher to attack, so I'm going to have to add a die. But we'll get back to that in a second. I'm just saying it now because I had forgotten earlier. But either way, the Chancellor's actually not with us, so these are not things that we could attack. What we could attack are, as I put this guy back, any sites that the purple player rules. You can kind of imagine that maybe we've secretly sent our, our armies to these places that the purple player rules. So not only are we going to attack this, we could attack the mountain, and we could attack the plains, but not the lush coast because he doesn't rule this place. There's no, um, he doesn't have any war bands on here. So in order to, we could maybe attack one of these things because the purple player's the defender, you can attack any location that they rule. Uh, I said it last time I recorded, I forgot to say it this time. That's part of why I use these cubes when I play because keeping track of all the different things that you are attacking, the relics, the pawn, the locations, I feel like that's a little confusing and I'm not sure why they didn't include something like this. But what we're gonna do, that place looks a little strong for us. Let's do attack the mountains. Again, I can attack the mountains because I picked the purple as the defender. And in that case, you can pick any location they rule. So following this guide, once you've picked your defender, you're gonna declare your targets. They could be any of these and this tree thing kind of helps you. So let's just review what it says. You could pick any relic or banner. So the banners are things like this. Okay, again, anything that has a shield is targetable. So you could pick any of their relics or banners if their pawn is at your site, because they would have to carry it on their person. You could attack the pawn and their money if their pawn is at your site. So we, we already talked about that. And if they do, if that target does rule the place where you're at, you have to attack that target. And you can also uh, hit any other sites that that character rules. All right, so we've done that. Next, once we picked our targets, we're gonna to have to start collecting our dice. The attacker is gonna grab dice up to the number of warbands on their board. We have nine warbands, so we're gonna grab nine dice. Now this is going to be modified, but that's where we start. The defender is gonna look at any of the things being attacked and grab that number of defense dice. So for example, we're attacking the mountains and the rocky coast. So we're gonna grab one blue die for the mountains, one blue die for the rocky coast. Once we've grabbed our base dice, then we need to check for modifiers. For example, we are attacking in the mountains, like we are attacking the mountains. So because of that, we need to lose one of our attack dice. Buckle up, this part's complicated too. Even though we're not attacking the planes, the purple player rules the planes, which means any of the battle cards, uh, what are these called, battle strategies or something like that? Any of these cards that have the battle symbol with the little crown apply because they are being ruled. So these battle cards have different colors. This one's kind of purplish. Sometimes they're red, sometimes they're blue. 
if it was red and you, as the attacker, ruled this, you would get that benefit. If this was blue, the ruler of the land would get the benefit as the defender. This one's purple, and so it's going to work for both attacker or defender. The purple player is currently defending, and this is a purple... Oh, that's two different purples. The Chancellor's defending, and they have this card, so they do get... Because they rule the site, we do get this benefit as the defender. So we're going to kind of look at this and figure out what would be best for the defender. This would mean, as the defender, we would subtract one attack die from the attacker. If the purple player, if the chancellor was the attacker and they ruled this site, they would get to add an additional attack die. Ooh, complicated. But either way, because the chancellor rules the planes, even though the planes are not part of this battle, they rule the planes, they get the benefit of the longbows, the longbow people are going to come help us in the battle, and so their benefit is they're going to remove another attack die. As I briefly mentioned earlier, the other benefit, because they're the Oath Keeper, they actually get to add a blue die. And so essentially, once you've picked your defender, once you've figured out your targets, everyone's collected and modified their dice. That's using the battle plans, it's helping with the modifier. Uh, then, we're going to start by rolling the defense dice. Now, I'm not exactly sure what the intention was with the rule book. Remember, I'm still kind of scripted here, even though I'm selling it so nicely. But they actually have a pre-scripted roll. I guess I'm going to follow that rather than just, like, rather than just full-on rolling it. Let's just follow the script. The script has us rolling this. And so that will be the plan. But let's look at the different die faces of the Defender dice. So we have a bunch of single shields, I think, two. Yeah, two single shields, two blanks, one double shield, one times two. And so the book was saying that the defender, the purple player, rolled this. So here's how you would handle that. Count up any shields that you've got, in this example, one, and then you're going to apply your multipliers. So the blue player rolled one shield, times two is two, times another two is four. So they're starting with four defense. Then, you're going to look at the sites being attacked. As the defender, they're going to have some number of warbands on there. And for each warband on those sites, you're going to add one. So we have four from the dice, plus another one, two, three, four from those warbands. So the defender currently has a defense value of eight. So the red player has to beat eight. You can't tie eight, you have to beat it. So let's talk about what's next. Again, uh, we would normally just roll these, but there is a scripted roll that they have that looks something like this. Um, oh, what was that other one? Oh, it was this. Okay, so let's just look at the nature of these dice. So on the attack dice, there are no blank sides. There are filled in swords. One, two, yeah, two, two filled in swords. One, two, three. Uh, yeah, three not filled in swords, and then one of these sides that looks like this. So obviously we're going to hit every single one of these swords on what they mean. Filled in swords are one attack. Not filled in swords are a half, meaning you have to have two of them to count as one successful attack. Some of these sides have two filled in swords, so that's two attack, wahoo, with a skull, the skull means that you would automatically remove a warband for each skull you see. So let's do that first. One, two. Two warbands, automatically dead. They go over here. Then we're going to count our total number of swords, remembering that these two count as one. And this is just a half. It's not going to count as anything else. So as an attacker, we rolled one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven attack. The defender has eight defense. We rolled seven attack. In order to beat the defender, we have to beat their number. So from here, I can start discarding these, just killing them off, until we beat the defender. So they had an eight, we're at a seven. So what we can do is go eight, nine, and that will get rid of the defender. We would have beaten them. Now, 
my nature says you would use that half like you would only need eight and a half to beat them but no don't count that as a half necessarily that just pairs up like that and otherwise your extra one would be useless so by by having two of these war bands die from the roll and then spending two more war bands what we've done is we've managed to win against the defender wahoo Woo, i just feel like it's a victory having discussed all of that malarkey okay so we're going to roll the attack. That's what it talks about right here. And then if your attack is higher than the defense, you are victorious. Obviously, if it was impossible to kill off these guys and still be victorious, you just wouldn't do it. You would just keep these things alive and just, just claim a defeat. So let's take a look here. <clears throat> so we're going to take losses. Uh, what that means is we're going to kill half of the warbands in the defeated player's force, rounded down. So these warbands are in their force. If their pawn was here and they were using the ward bands on their on their uh, player board, I think those count as your force too. I'm gonna have to double check that before we go too far. But these were the ward bands available, the the number that you added at the end, were these four. So we're gonna remove half, and the other half is gonna go to their board. So half go to the board, half are removed. They're over here. Now. If we, the attacker, had lost, our force were the war bands that were still on our board. We would kill half of the war bands on our board, um, and then, yeah, I, th I think. I'm going to have to double check that. Okay, next we resolve the victory. If you are victorious, when it's talking about you, that you are the attacker, okay? So if you are, well, resolve. If you are victorious, take your targets. If you targeted the sites, you may place any number of war bands, even zero, from your force onto any targeted sites. So we targeted the mountains and the rocky coast. If we had targeted relics or banners, we would take them. If we had targeted the pawn and the favor, then uh, it says you may make them travel to a site of your choice, spending no supply, and you may burn half of their favor rounded down. And burning means you actually just remove the coins from the game. It's not that you actually get them, which is an interesting thing. But here's what's going to happen next. I get to decide which of these war bands that I actually want to put out. Um, I'm going to grab three. I'm going to put one of these on the mountain and two of these on the rocky coast. And now I rule two locations or sites. The purple player only rules one since I, the yellow player, currently rule more sites than the purple player. I'm actually the new oath keeper. So I'm going to grab this. And put it here. You could obviously, it's kind of designed to go here, but for purposes of this video, I'm putting it up here. And if by some miracle, and again, I'm keeping these here as defense in case someone else uh, attacks me, maybe, I don't know, I'm following the script. But if I can keep this title until the beginning of my next turn, then it would flip over to the usurper side. I guess they don't flip it the way I flip it. And then if I could keep this until the beginning of my next turn after that, I would win. All right, so for now, we are the Oath Keepers, but we still have a bunch of supply to keep this turn going. I'm going to go ahead and search the deck. So to search the deck currently costs three, because that's the cost right here. I could have just paid two to search the discard pile, but we're going to go one, two, three. I didn't encounter any visions at all. And let's see what we've got here. We have tents. What this means is that when we take a travel action, we could spend a coin, and uh, it says, so yeah, so when we travel, you move your pawn to another site. We could spend a coin, as well as our supply. Spend, oh, in order to spend no supply if you're traveling to a site in your own region. Okay? Next, oh, here's a battle plan that I was talking about that's blue. So if you ruled a site that had bear traps, then you would, as the defender, get to use this, you would subtract one attack die and kill one warband on the attacker's board. Cool. So that's almost like subtracting uh, two things. Well, it's a battle plan, so it comes after they've gather gathered the dice. But yeah. Okay. I'm sure that made sense. Next, we have true names. This one would be an advisor you'd keep there. And what's that action there? That is the campaign action. And it says, your enemy cannot use battle plans that match any of your advisors against you. Oh, okay. Now, with this, you see how this border is darker than the other one, like that? My understanding is that that border means that this has to do with enemies, people that are attacking you or doing stuff against you, if I remember correctly. 
So these are the three cards. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually keep tents and we're going to discard the other two. Since we're at the hinterlands, we don't discard here. We discard to the cradle. Oh my gosh, could I make a mess out of that? And I'm going to choose to play this at my site. So it's here. And remember, when you play a card to a site, look at the order or the faction, and they're going to pay you for that. So if I had played an order, there's no coins here, um, then they would not have been able to pay me. I could still play the card, but I wouldn't get money for it. So that's kind of one of those things where uh, I think it was the red player was really kind of bankrupting the order faction, and now they're a little less powerful. They can't pay for stuff. But either way, we got that coin. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this coin on the tents card so that I don't have to spend any supply if I'm going to travel within the region, which is really helpful for the hinterlands because it's three to travel within the hinterland region. I'm going to go ahead and use that to just travel down to this location here and take a look. Okay, this location does have a relic. We're going to look at what this means here in just a moment. So let's grab a relic. Those come from right here. It is a free action for us to be able to see what this is, but since I'm going to be removing the yellow player this game, I'm going to not look at that. Okay, so we have a relic here. And really quickly, what this icon means, because it is confusing and it's not very clear on here, but this is, this is the one that I'm figuring out is what it means. Yeah. So what I think this means is that if we play one of the Discord factions, that's one of the suits, if we play a Discord faction to this site, then we would get to take the relic that was here. Or if we chose not to do that, we could pick up that relic by burning two secrets, putting those back in the supply. That's what I think that that card means. But with that all said, what I'm going to do is go ahead and end the yellow player's turn. So we're going to return these coins uh, back down here to the nomads. Oh, I could remove these cubes from our earlier battle. And taking a look here, I have two, four, six, eight nine did i do that right three eh, yeah i have nine supply so i'd go here or nine war bands so i'd go here but i had one more to spare so i would go all the way to the left now as i mentioned before my gosh we are so far into this video we just finished round one that's cool um at this point even even the rule book says if you're playing with fewer than four players pick one of the colors and remove everything from there so what I'm going to do at this point is we're going to go ahead and remove the yellow components from the board. So I'm going to grab this warband. Oh, let's get these out of the way. Okay, we're going to grab this and these, which means they no longer rule those sites. So I am going to hand this back to the chancellor because they currently rule one site, but nobody else rules anything. All of their cards get discarded, and I'm assuming we would just follow the normal rules. We were in the hinterlands, so we're going to discard this to the cradle. And I will off camera kind of go ahead and spread our characters out just so that the, the player areas look a little bit cleaner as we're moving from one player to the next. And we're going to be starting with the purple player, obviously, because they're next. But what I do want to say is that was all scripted. Every single thing that you just saw me do was written in the book. That was all the first round. This is my first playthrough with it. I kind of wanted to take you through what a first player experience would be, even though I did read the rule book several times, which maybe you wouldn't have. I don't know. There are still more rules that we will cover again in a future round, which the round marker will always turn when you get to the chancellor's turn. So the first thing they do is they're going to move the round marker. So I, there are more things I want to cover. I'll either cover them here or here. I'm not exactly sure. As you could tell, <laughs> there's a lot going on. Um, but yeah, having said that, what I wanted to point out is from here on out, training wheels are off. I think I have a pretty good grasp on the rules of the game, so I'm just going to continue forward. Obviously, this is my very first play. In all my other videos, I play several times before I do it on camera, believe it or not. So, number one, you're going to see some rules mistakes. I always have rules mistakes. If you catch a mistake, let me know. I'll annotate it. Number two. None of my videos are ever a strategy guide, but especially this one. You're going to be discovering the strategy with me as I'm going through. So <laughs> I, there's just going to be times where I'm just like, I don't know, I guess I'll do this as I try to figure out what I'm going to have each of my players do. So yeah, expect there might be some rules mistakes, but I think I know what I'm doing and not a strategy guide. And if you can accept all of that stuff, 
We will talk more about citizenship and more about these banners here as time goes on. And then we're just going to go ahead and keep going and finish this game. So here we are back with the Chancellor who just had, you know, the Rude Awakening. They thought they were invincible. The yellow player came and took the Oath Keeper title. But then the Chancellor, you know, worked its magic and made the yellow player disappear. So we've really got to make sure that we can start ruling some more places soon. The nice thing is there are a lot of empty spaces, and by empty I mean nobody rules them. We've got the mountains, we've got the lush coast, and we have the rocky coast, and we have the wastes. And so, you know, there are places to rule. They're all currently ruled by bandits, which are a little bit easier to fight than other players. So I want to claim these as soon as I can. But I'm also going to want to muster. Now remember, mustering is going to take a coin, but I want to be able to do that few times if possible so what I'm thinking is what if I do a trade on the site that I'm at at the lush coast if I do a trade I could pay a secret in order to gain one coin for the initial trade plus because of where I am I'll get another coin for having this advisor so let's start there so I'm gonna go ahead and do a trade which means let's move this down one I'm gonna bring a book and that goes right here notice this is the beast faction and I have a beast advisor, so I get one coin for the trade, plus another one for having a matching advisor. So that comes from right here, uh, two. And now, just in case I wasn't clear or more clear earlier, because there's something on this card, I can't use that card to do anything else. Like, I couldn't pay a coin and use this action to travel. Like, that card is now unusable, basically. Because I rule this site, if there were actions over here, I might be able to use those but I can't. So I guess what I'm saying is I, I need to move. So I'm going to use the Lush Coast benefit to travel. It's only going to cost me one to go to another coast. So this will be extra nice. So I'm going to spend the one to travel and move from here to here. Specifically, I'm doing that because it's going to kind of give me places to take more actions. Just to recap what's over here, if I wanted to, I could spend two coins as an action to gain a secret, or I could um, spend a coin when I travel so that I don't have to spend supply and I could move here. But I think I'm pretty happy right there. I'm gonna use these two cards to help me muster. So I know I'm kind of doing one action. I'm gonna do the same action twice, just I'm gonna do it all at one time. So to muster is one supply, so I'm gonna do this twice. And then I'm gonna gain two war bands for each time I do that, so that would be four altogether. And then I also need to pay one coin for each time I'm doing this. And so those go there. But now I'm actually hesitating. Hold on. I'm going to take one of those back. Let me take this one back. I'm going to take one of these back. Because, let me put these back. I need two to campaign. And if I don't campaign now, then the other players get to fight against the bandits. And that's going to be a lot easier on them. So I want to make sure that I can do this. So, campaign. Let's see how well I screw this up. You start by declaring a defender. That defender has to be somebody else on your tile. They have to have a wooden piece there. If not, then that means the bandits rule this tile. And all of the empty sites are ruled by bandits, so you can attack any and all of those sites that you want to. I have enough stuff. I think I'd like to defend two sites, and I want it to be the coasts. I guess. I don't know strategically if it makes more sense to rule one place over another. Definitely you want to rule places with actions for sure. So I don't know. Let's go ahead and we're going to fight for this one and fight for this one. Again, as I mentioned, I'm going to kind of be discovering the, bat the strategy as I go. Hopefully I've got the mechanics down. Okay, so you start by declaring your target and then or your defender, the bandits, and then your targets, those two locations and you need to gather dice for those things. Now again, the bandits rule these empty places. So if, for example, let's pretend if this was down here, then the bandits rule this place, they would get to use this battle card. So keep that in mind as you're making your adjustments. But for now, the bandits rule, so they're gonna get these two dice. As the attacker, we get one die per warband on our board. And 
I don't think there's any modifying that's going to be happening right now. Like, we don't have any cards. The location uh, doesn't have anything to do with it. It's just the coast. So I think at this point we're good to just roll. So the bandits are going to roll these ones. So they only have one. Plus, they basically have one warband on each location is how you can imagine it. So essentially, it's... There's two locations, so their defense is two, plus whatever you roll. So their defense is three. Should be pretty easy to take them over. I just realized I forgot to spend my two to campaign. Okay, so we're gonna roll this. Oh, okay, so we need, a, we need three to win. So one, two, three, and then four. So we did win both of those locations. So if there was the defender there, we would remove their banners or their war bands. That's not the case. So all we're gonna do is choose what we wanna put on. I'm not sure how many we wanna put on in various places. I think I would really like to hold on to that rocky coast. So I'm gonna put three war bands on the rocky coast and I'm gonna put um, two on the lush coast. Okay. Now, we're good there. So I'm going to go ahead and just clear off the cubes and stuff so we don't have to worry about them. I am out of supply, but I could do this action here because I am at this spot. And even if I wasn't at this spot because I now rule this site, I would be able to take that action. So, wahoo. I'm going to go ahead and take this action. Is this wise? Is this not wise? I don't quite know. But we're going to go ahead and pay two coins to gain a secret. I just feel like the Chancellor should have a bunch of secrets. Doesn't that make sense? And with that, that'll be the end of their turn. Let's get this out of the way. So we're going to go ahead and rest. So, oh, let's go move the coins and the secrets. So these coins go to the nomads. This secret comes back to me. And then I have three, six, that's crazy. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. So we're back here, that's the end of their turn. Now before I talk about the red player, let's do talk a little bit more about this banner that has two coins on it. Notice, I'm gonna read it correctly this time. The wake phase, you must put a coin here, or if you don't, then we're gonna have to move a coin from here to the favor bank with at least one coin. So we can't put it on an empty one, we've gotta put it on, uh, on a bank that has more than that. Then, after that's taken care of, if this banner has six plus, then we would flip it and other stuff would end up happening, okay? So we'll talk about that in a second. So I basically just have to decide if I'm gonna pay a coin to keep their favor or make it harder for other people to take the favor or if I want to just kind of let the favor slide, making it easier for somebody to seize it from me. I think while I have the coin, let's do put this on here. That'll make it so that either the Chancellor or the blue player would have to spend four in order to take it. Otherwise, if I don't put the money on there and a coin leaves, then they would only have to spend two. So yeah, let's do this turn, put a coin there, and I'll wanna keep coins coming so that I don't lose the people's favor. Now, even though they look orange, this is the red player, I'm going to have them kind of focus on attacking. They're gonna go for the Oath Keeper thing. And then I'll, I'll have the blue player kind of work on their vision that they've got. So, but for the red player, let's have them really try to gain those sights. So first things first, we're gonna to need to muster. So let's muster, oh crap, am I gonna have enough moves? This is gonna be tricky. I'm gonna want more cards to open up. I, I need more cards in my hand so that I can play them to the sites so that we can do more stuff at each site. So probably the very first thing I'm gonna to wanna to do is um, search. And because I'm trying to save on some money, let's search the discard pile. I'm actually a little bit hesitant because if I remember correctly, as a vid someone videoing this, I think it was the red player who had drawn the vision that uh, that would let you win faster if you can win that many sites. But I think that got discarded over here. So I'm eventually gonna wanna search that deck. Um, I'm pretty sure the red player knows about that card. So I'm gonna, my goal is to get over there and start searching soon. Maybe I just go now. 
Maybe I don't search. Maybe I travel first. Oh my gosh. Hold on. Let me, I should think before I record. Here's what I'm going to do. I already spent the two supply. I'm not going to do that to search here. I'm going to use that to travel here. From here, then I'm going to search that discard pile. So that would be another two. Crap. I'm not going to have enough supply. But we draw just like we do the other one. One at a time. One, two, three. Crap. Okay, there's the vision. So I'm going to have to search again. But either way, I know I'm going to want to play to a site because that's the whole point is I'm trying to get more cards on these sites. If I can find one of the Discord. No, none of these are Discord. Okay. This says spend no supply if you're going to muster on one of those cards. That's very helpful. So I'm going to want one of those at the location. So I know I'm not going to want this long lost air. That's going to be discarded. What else have we got here? Roving Terror. As an action, discard a denizen card. That's, again, these cards here. Discard a denizen card at any other site and move this card there. Or the Old Oak. If trading with the Old Oak, gain a book. Uh, sorry. The Old Oak for secrets. Gain one more secret for any advisors you have. And I do have one of those advisors. Let's do put this Old Oak back out there. So I'm going to play this card. And it's going to go here. I'm sad that I didn't have this card to play because that would have helped me pick up the relic. But this is going to get discarded. I'm just going to do it. Discard and then the cradle. I can look at this relic anytime as the red player. I just have to remember the red player knows what this is. Okay, sticky fire. Two defense dice if someone tries to take it. It's a battle plan card. Apparently it's heavy. And it says, if you're victorious, you may kill all of the warbands in your enemy's force. If you do, you must give them coin or a favor if able. Oh, interesting, especially because I am going to be trying to fight. I probably do want that, but I don't necessarily need it right now. But because I played the card here, they're going to give me a coin, which will be very useful because I'm going to want to... Oh, I need to muster. Ah. As much as I want to use these coins i want to trade with the tree to get some more secrets but i really should use my animal playmates to muster so i don't have to spend supply so i think that's what i'm going to do i'm going to go ahead and muster on the old oak because i don't need to spend any supply to do that and that's going to get me two of these um all right I think I'm going to go ahead and search again. So that'll be two, because I'm going to go to the discard pile to do that. I have to stop after I draw the one, because it is a vision card. And it is the vision that says, you win if you rule the most, sorry, if you rule the most sites and at least three visions have been drawn. Only two have been drawn so far, but that's okay. I'm going to go ahead and hold on to this and keep it secret. I can still have space for one more card so that's good and I know I have one more supply sorry one more supply that I could take another action but I don't have two supply I can't campaign oh man it's like we're taking the big breath before we do lots of stuff oh and I wanted to also review what this says when you uh, search and we play the card to a site what this is saying is that we could first discard a denizen card that is at any site in your region. But I don't think that there's anything there that I want to discard. Um, and I could have played that card to any site. I guess at the most, I could discard the elders so the purple player doesn't have access to them because that is in the same region. Or I could discard this. Ooh, I don't know. I think I'll, um, I don't know what the advantages are. It would just be mean to discard them. Should we do it? Why not? We have the people's banner. Let's do it. For that one time that we searched, let's go ahead and discard this card. Uh, I could have done it twice. Um, hmm. Yeah, let's just, let's just discard this one. So because we were at the hinterland, it goes to the cradle. And again, I'm doing that because I have the banner. That's what it says right here when I take the search action. That's what I can do. Now, I hadn't really looked at the backside of this about what happens if we get too many coins on here. But basically what happens is this flips over and becomes a mob. And it says that uh, basically the big difference is during the wake phase, you must put a coin here 
or move a coin uh, or move, sorry, you must put favor here or move favor here to the favor bank with the least favor and we have to do that twice. So this thing's gonna be more expensive for me to hold on to it. So I'll just keep that in mind. I wanna kind of keep, it's kind of like you wanna give the people favors, but not too many favors, because then they become greedy. Okay, well, I guess that really was the end of the turn, I think. So we had two, four, six, eight, nine, plus we have one extra, so we go all the way up here. All right, that's the end of the red player's turn. And again, I'm not revealing this vision because I don't want other people to know that I have it. Okay, here is our blue player. Now the blue player, a couple of things I wanna talk about. First of all, we do have a wake thing we're gonna to have to do, but also remember we have this secret uh, vision over here, which means that we can win if we hold the most relics and banners, and this is face up, and there have been at least three visions drawn. So some goals that I'm gonna work on. Number one, I've gotta get relics and I wanna get banners. That could be the red player's banner of the people, or it could be the dark secret banner that's still in the main supply area. So I'm gonna to wanna to do that. I'm also gonna to wanna to search to get the other visions drawn. I need to get those things drawn. But before I do any of that, the salt flats have a wake action, which means you get to draw one of these things from here. So let's do take a secret and that'll be good. Next, uh, one of the things I was gonna talk about later was this dark secrets uh, banner. It's a little bit wordy, but after some mistakes, I think I figured this out. Basically, this is currently over in the main supply area. And this says that a player can only recover this if there is a card at our site that whose suit does not match any of the advisors that we've got. So what I need to do is I need to search, I need to search and get a card played to that site so that I can recover. And I need to make sure that it doesn't match uh, my advisor here. So that's going to be the first thing that I do. I'm going to want to draw from the draw pile. I know it's going to cost three, which really sucks, but that cost of three will let me maybe get closer towards another vision. So draw one at a time. One, oh, there we go. There is a third vision drawn. So at this point, visions are playable. Let's look at what this vision is. Okay, so vision of faith. You win if you hold the darkest secret and at least three visions have been drawn. So that's also a good vision for me to have because I'm gonna try to get the dark secret. Hmm. Oh man, what do I wanna do? But I also need to play this so that I can get the dark secret. Okay, well, all right. I guess this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna play this card to the location and we're gonna discard this one. We are currently at the provinces, so this gets discarded to the hinterlands, which does make me nervous. But we'll see how that all plays out. Maybe I can go swipe it again a little bit later. So I'm playing this here, and because it's Nomad, I gain a coin. Okay. Now, I'm going to do the recover action. So the recover action is gonna be one supply. I'm recovering the banner of the darkest secret. So let me show you how this works. There's one secret on here currently. I need to put more secrets on here than already exist. The new holder is gonna then take one secret and the old holder gets everything else. So I just put this on here and now I've got this and somebody would have to spend three secrets to take this from me. And if they did put three secrets on here, when this transfers, I would get, the new person would get one and I would get whatever's left over, the other one. So it's a little bit complicated, but that's the thing. The other nice thing though about having this is that I can spend two supply and it would always cost me, sorry, it would always cost me two supply to draw from the main draw pile. Where right now it costs four to draw from there. So yeah, okay but four, or sorry, three visions have been drawn. I have to decide at which point I reveal this vision. Hmm, it would have to be revealed at the beginning of my turn. Oh man, okay, so here's what I'm thinking about. What I'm thinking about is the fact that this vision, I, if I played it now, everybody would know what I'm aiming for. And it says that you win if you hold the most relics and banners Right now, I do because I have two of them. The red player has one banner, the chancellor has one relic. 
So could I figure out how to get another relic? Probably. I might be able to, especially because I have this banner. Do I reveal that I've got this? Not till the end of my turn. And oops, really quickly, I need to remember that this needed to go here at the end of the red player's turn. The reason I noticed that is because I was thinking, could I travel over here? If I travel over here, I'm not gonna have enough supply to also get that relic. But I do wanna position myself over there. But probably before I go over there, I'm gonna want one of these cards. Okay, so I think while I'm here, I'm gonna spend two to search from the deck again. Next turn, I'll travel. Again, is this the right thing to do? Really, probably not, but we're doing it anyway. Okay, so one card at a time. Okay. I also plan on using this. I'm gonna spend a secret here, I think, to take a peek at what the red player's vision is. I think that's what they would do as the blue player. Well, let's look at these. Um, okay, so this says if you play a denizen card, oh, this would have to be played to the location. During the search action, if you play a denizen card that was not a face down advisor, gain a coin from the hearth bank. Okay, that seems nice. Over here, uh, when played, you may swap a great herd with a different nomad card at any site. Okay, and then here, Book of Burning. If you're victorious and targeted the defender's pawn, uh, they also burn all of the secrets on their board except their last. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to hold on to this one because it's going to help me get the relic on the other spot. Um, let me remind you what that is. The relic here, if it's still around, uh, you would need to play one of these cards to this site in order to pick up this relic. Otherwise, you'd have to burn two secrets, which is kind of hard to come by, or maybe people don't want to do that. They wouldn't want to do that if they knew, okay, I'm going to keep my vision secret. That's what I'm going to do. And then we're discarding these, uh, oh, here, to the hinterlands. Hinterland, whatever. Let's go ahead and put a secret on here so that I could peek at any face down site, advisor, or relic at a site. I'm going to go ahead and peek at this advisor card because it's face down in front of the red player i'm pretty sure i can do this take a peek and i see okay so they are going to try to get the most sites so i'm going to go ahead and just hand that back to them now that i've taken a peek and with that i will end my turn here because then i could pick up a favor at the beginning of my next turn so now i'm at two four six eight ten let's see, yeah and i have one extra so i'm gonna resupply up to here grab that secret it comes back so we are back to the Chancellor's turn. So before I take their turn, let's do pause. Part of what I was going to talk about was those banners. We've been talking about the banners, even though I've been sucking at talking about those banners. But the other huge thing that we have to talk about in this game is something called citizenship. So before I talk about citizenship, let me point this out. I can, oh, I have to remember all this crap. Every one of these exile boards has their exile side and they also have a citizen side. So the citizen side still lists the actions as normal, but a couple other changes worth noticing. Their supply is gonna depend on what the chancellor's supply is. Because basically, as a citizen, if we become a citizen, we're kind of allied with the chancellor, even though we still have our own win conditions, and I'll talk about that. But I want to point out that this is going to change, and also there's no spot for a vision here. You might become a citizen and then go back to being an exile, but oh, I wish they'd flip those the other way. But I just wanted to point out that every board, you could either be a citizen or an exile. You always start as an exile, but it's possible that the chancellor could offer you citizenship. So let me put these back on here so that I don't forget. The way that a citizen would win if they become allied with the Chancellor, is through the victory condition listed right here, the successor to the Chancellor. And in this example, the goal of a citizen would be to hold more relics and banners than anybody else. If, as a citizen, you can do this, that's how you would beat the Chancellor. So, that's the case in this specific game. The Oath Keeper, is trying to rule the most sites, so that's what the Chancellor's doing. 
if someone were to become a citizen, they would be trying to hold on to the onto more relics and banners. Basically the same goal that the blue player currently has. The way that would work is the person who holds the Grand Scepter, usually the Chancellor, because they start off with it and it's pretty tough to take. They have, well, I just breathed weird. They have this writing down here. This says you cannot use this if you took it this turn, so you'd have to wait a full turn. But basically you have two different actions available here. One action for free. You can peek at the Imperial Reliquary, which is down here. And the other action you could take is offer citizenship to an exile, or you could exile any citizen except for yourself. So if by chance someone had stolen this and uh, they make themselves a citizen, they could not go backwards and make themselves an exile. But if as a chancellor, I noticed that somebody had a lot of war bands, you could basically turn their war bands into yours by offering somebody any of these relics down here. So these have been hidden, but as an action we can peek at them. So you can look at these at any time. We won't look too closely. I'll just hold them up to the camera for a second. But there's this obsidian cage you could offer somebody. Notice it's like a battle one. And see down here that if you were to get rid of this card as the person holding the Grand Scepter and therefore holding the Imperial Reliquary, we would also unlock an, an um, unlock a, a bonus <laughs> what do you call it basically a new power so there's this one right here so brutal if you're the attacker the defeated player even if it's you must kill all of the warbands in their force that's brutal or if we were to offer this relic to somebody it would unlock this power so the relic that would be offered from this one is a whistle choose a pawn at another site they must travel to your site if able spending no supply if they do Give them uh, the secrets that are, the secret that there, and then you would off or then you would have this new ability, decadent, and so on. So like I don't want to go over every one of these, but basically there are these relics. You could offer these relics to a player, and by by giving them something special, something that could definitely help them. Okay, then you're also unlocking a power for yourself. If that person accepts, they would get the. They don't have to, but if they accept then they would become a citizen by flipping their board, as I showed you, and all of their war bands would be removed and turned into purple war bands. So these five would turn into five purple war bands that the Chancellor kind of has control over. We don't have any now, but that would also include any war bands that are on the board. Basically, you're turning into a citizen, you, you, you get rid of your war bands, and they all become the Chancellor's war bands. And yes, this would even happen if somehow the blue player got the scepter, offered citizenship to the red player, the warbands still become purple. They become chancellor warbands. And again, as a citizen, you would just continue the game totally like normal. Except, as you move warbands around, you have to ask permission from the chancellor because they are the chancellor's warbands. Basically, you have to like ask them permission to do stuff. But you're going to be able to continue working and you'll just be aiming for this goal over here. So as, as a citizen, you would be trying to hold more banners and relics than the Chancellor, than any other player. And if you could do that when the end game is triggered, you actually would win the game over the Oath Keeper, even if the Oath Keeper has more sites. So it's just this whole kind of complicated changing of goals that can happen. Now, again, without going into too much detail, whoever holds the Grand Scepter, you could see that it says that you can exile a citizen. I wish that they had put more information about exiling citizens visibly here. But essentially, if you're holding the Grand Scepter and you want to re-exile somebody, you would need to pay them five favor, five coins. And that could be modified depending on the Oath Keeper status. It's like, why is this so complicated? I don't even know. Or if you were a citizen and you wanted to like exile yourself again, um, then it shows you on your citizen board, it says right here, you can exile yourself unless you hold the Grand Scepter, then you couldn't. By getting giving the holder of the Grand Scepter favor equal to the number of war bands on your board plus your total number of secrets once you exile yourself and your act phase and refresh. So there's this whole thing about like you can, you can citizenize and you can exile or whatever. Uh, yeah, uh, you might you might want to discover that more in the rule book if you're interested. It's here on page 26. It's right after the walkthrough stuff, and it's this page right here. Okay, it's a little complicated, but essentially the successor to the chancellor could win if they were a citizen and if they hold more relics and banners. 
which I don't know, maybe the blue player would want to do that. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how this plays out. I don't see myself citizenizing because it's so confusing, but that is something that could happen. But either way, here we are at um, the purple player's turn, and they're still really trying to hold on to all of the power that they can. Probably what we want to do is rule a couple more places. To do that, I would guess that we're going to want to start with a muster action. So one of these, let's muster using this card and pulling two of these. Uh, let's travel to an empty site. It's going to cost me two to travel. And let's open up this place down here. Okay, so a couple of things to notice. First of all, we need to put a relic there. There's two card limit, um, and we'll have to look up that special power right here. So we traveled here. We're going to put a relic. We could look at the relic ourselves, the Cursed Cauldron. It's a battle plan. If you're victorious, gain one warband per enemy warband killed this campaign. Ooh, that's pretty great. Okay, so that one goes there. And then we could either burn a secret or what does that mean? Let's see, that means that when traveling from here, you may flip one secret, flip, one secret on your board face down to spend no supply and ignore the narrow pass power. We still haven't seen the narrow pass. Face down secrets cannot be used to pay a cost. Okay, okay, well, and what would they do once they're flipped down? Maybe the narrow pass flips it back up. I have no idea. But why don't we go ahead and, do you know what? I think I will burn I'm gonna burn, this is a great this is a great one so I am gonna burn a secret to pick this up which should make the blue player nervous because now we've got these two uh, so yeah this goes back into the supply and then I am gonna go ahead and campaign see if I could get a couple of my war bands we're just going to be fighting over the buried giant I know that that's like not a great use of supply to only battle over one place but where I only have a handful of war bands, that feels like the right thing to do. Does it? No. Let's add the mountain in there too. That'll be fun. I'm nervous. I think, especially because the mountain is hard to battle over, but it would make it easier to defend. Sure. So, um, oh, but a nice thing though is, did I do this last time? I do get to use my longbows because I do rule that. I'll have to annotate that on the last battle. Okay, so a couple of things. First of all, uh, the bandits will defend. So they get two dice, and then we'll add two to whatever they roll. For us, because we rule the longbows, we're gonna get an additional dice. So we have four war bands, so we're gonna get these four. Plus, we're fighting over the mountain, so that will make us lose a die. But we have longbows, so we're gonna pick up a die. And I'm not exactly sure how the cursed cauldron works when we're fighting against bandits because they technically have two war bands. I'll, I'll do some looking. I'm at a good pausing point after this. So either way, I've got these four dice here. The defender rolls first. Oh, dang, I wasn't expecting that. Okay, so they have four. This may not go in our favor. Nope, okay, so we had these two, we need to beat four though, so we're gonna have to kill off three in order to win. That sucks, that really sucks. Okay, so we will go ahead and kill those off. Oh no, do you know what? They actually had four plus two, because I think they have the two war bands, so we would have had to beat six. We have two, we can't get to seven, Oh no, so we lost. We totally lost. Oh crap. Okay, so what happens when you lose? Just a reminder, so we resolve the victory. If you are victorious, we are not. Um, we're gonna need to kill half of the war bands in the defeated player's force rounded down. So we need to, we're gonna lose two of these. Oh no. Well, and we were not victorious, so I won't even have to worry about that. Nice job, Chancellor. Uh, crap. Well, that was embarrassing. Hopefully nobody was around to see it. Though I can see this eye was peeking over the hill, watching dangerously. So let's go ahead and end the Chancellor's turn here. So we're going to give this to the Nomads. The Nomads are getting real rich. 
And let's see, we're at 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. Again, so here we are. And yeah, that'll be the end of their turn. All right, so we know what we want the red player to do, but first we got to do this wake thing. Um, let's do put, well, I'm going to need my coins. Oh, man, yeah, I'm going to need my coins. So I'm going to not put a coin on this favor, which means that on the wake phase, we either put one here or move one here to the favor bank with the least coins. So that's going to go up here to the order, um, order or faction, whatever, this, this one right here, because they don't have any coins. Now, obviously, I'm going to want to muster, but to muster, I'm going to need coins. I'm going to need cards to place those coins on, um, stuff like that. Now, it's not going to cost me any supply to muster, which is nice, but I've got plenty of other stuff I need to kind of worry about. So while we're here, let's start. What have I got here? Well, I could get a bunch of coins if I got rid of my secrets. Is that worth it? I'm not sure that I necessarily need my secrets right now for anything. Hmm. Okay, so I am going to go ahead and start with this action. I'm going to burn one of my secrets and put another one here. And that's going to get me four coins. And I can get that from any of the banks. Again, I'm not totally sure about this economy playing out this nomad stack is really high so i kind of just want to take four coins from there i'm not sure if it's worthwhile like grabbing one from the order probably i feel like that kind of does affect the purple player negatively in the sense of that's they do have a bunch of order cards they rule i don't know i'm not totally sure about the strategy there necessarily but let's at least start here so that we have a way to muster so for my next action, it's not going to cost any supply if I'm mustering on one of these cards. And so I am going to go ahead and not spend any supply. Let's do spend the one coin. I'm going to use the old oak to muster, not to get more secrets, even though I might end up regretting that. And we'll grab two of these. Now I was thinking it would be super nice to get another beast faction over here so that I can use my animal playmates, but this location has a maximum of one card that can end up here. So if I'm going to search, I would probably need to move. I don't know that I would spend three just to move down here and open up that location necessarily. I just need to move somewhere where I can play on the cards. So let me spend two in order to move here because then at least I have a card that I could use to muster on. It's not the suit that I want, so I'm going to have to spend supply, but that's okay. It's just one supply, so let me do that. Spend this, use that to muster, and that will get me two of these. Now, if I were to jump into battle, there are one, two, three, four locations ruled by bandits that I could go after. Now, we saw what happened last time. Worst case scenario, what would, there's a lot of worst case scenarios here. Very worst case scenario. I mean, it's statistically not probable, but they would have four dice to roll. If they roll doubles, that would be eight plus the other four is 12. I'd have to beat 12. And if I'm fighting over the mountains, I'm going to lose a die. So that does make me nervous. I could spend two more to travel down here. But then if I muster one more time to get two more war bands, let's see, muster, so traveling for two, mustering for one, because it wouldn't be free because of the, like, I wouldn't have the ability to use that. Yeah, probably, that probably wouldn't be worth it. Maybe what I could do, though, is maybe I search? If I search, it would be two, and then I would have enough to campaign. And I'm not sure if searching is going to get me exactly what I need. I do have this ability because I have the, the banner of the people. When playing to a site, you may first discard a denizen card at any site in your region. Oh, duh. I could have done that to search over there. Hmm. I totally forgot about that. That's okay. Let me... I am going to search... 
in hopes of maybe getting like a weapon or like some kind of a battle card maybe i have no idea but let's do go ahead and spend two to search the discard pile if nothing else maybe i could get a beast card let's see one two three if i have a beast card then i could play it oh and muster for free okay so this one is a battle card but it would cost a secret which i don't have anymore if you hold the darkest secrets oh which i don't okay so i don't want that next we have the spirit snare it would take a secret action take uh, a favor from any one favor bank or the wolves i'd have to spend a, a book as an action to kill one warband even yours on any one board what i'm going to do is i will go ahead and play this card here discarding the other two over here i'm specifically getting this card out so that i can muster on it so mustering's not going to cost me because of this it's not going to cost me any supply because i do have another beast one there oh and the beasts i'm going to grab that from the beasts they do put a favor on here and I'm going to go ahead and muster. And I'm still pretty nervous that I'm spreading myself too thin. But the Chancellor currently rules three places. So do I just rule three? Oh man, what would this do? Okay, I would love to get two banners out and still have three. Do you know what? I think I'm going to go bold here. Let's try. Oh my gosh, I'm scared. Let's let's go after four places because if i can be successful then i could grab this oath keeper it will help me a little bit with defense i would be able to put two banners on those four locations and still have three left over uh, i don't know i'm nervous but we're going to try it out so next up we're going to go ahead and campaign spending our last two supply i'm declaring the bandits as the target which i would have to nobody else is here and yes i can even go after these places because they're not currently ruled by anybody so I'm going to see if I can nab all four of these places. So because of that, I'm going to grab four defense dice. And as far as I could see, um, oh, do you know what? I do think that the bandits do get to use this because um, it doesn't cost anything. The rule for bandits using stuff is they'll use stuff that doesn't cost anything. And they're defending. So let's reread this. It says, move any warbands to and from your board and any sites you rule, except the last warband from a site. At the end, discard warning signals. Okay, so I don't, mm, I don't think they're using that because that involves like decision making. And then for us, we're going to grab two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven attack dice. There are only 10 available in the game, but also because the mountains are part of this battle, we're the attacker is going to lose one, so that's okay. So we went from 11 down to 10, and I don't think we have anything else that's going to necessarily help us anywhere. So I think we've modified as much as we're going to. So let's see how miserable this is. I'm pretty nervous. Okay, so they rolled two times two so they have four here plus one for each location so they have a total of eight defense so now it's us so now it's up to us to beat that number i think we can physically beat that number because we have 11 warband over here but obviously i don't want to lose all that warband because that's gonna screw up my ruling okay here we go Wow, that turned out pretty good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, which is what I needed to beat. Nine, ten, plus one of these automatically dies. Wow, I was not expecting so many solid shields. That's awesome. We won that battle psh, easily. So at this point, it's just a matter of populating the board. I think we're going to go for two on each location and just leave two behind. I think that makes sense. So we're gonna go ahead and rule these, which would allow us, even if we're not on a site with an action on it, it would allow us to use those actions in the future. And because we rule four sites and the um, chancellor only rules three, we are now the Oath Keepers. And I'm honestly not totally sure if it's too early for this, but I almost want to just reveal my vision. Um, 
or do I just reveal it next turn when I spend a bunch of turns really mustering and having a lot of yeah, maybe that's when I do it. I think I'm too weak to reveal this yet, probably. Though, I guess they're probably going to come after me anyway. So, rather than just having to survive two rounds, I could just survive the one round is an option. Do I want to reveal this? I know it's kind of dumb that I'm like trying to reveal it against myself, but I'm, again, trying to think strategically. What if we do go ahead... Let's reveal this and just see what happens. Though again, strategically, maybe I might wait one more round and really build up muster and get these last defenses to just try to hold on to these places. But I do think I'm going to go ahead and end my turn at this point. Because um, I don't have any of these supply. I can't even muster some more right now. I should also say, I don't think I said it in this video, which is sad because we're like two hours in. As a free action, you can move warbands to and from your board as you want to. So that's fine. Oh, oops, I made a mistake over here. These were supposed to be down here. Sorry. Okay, but we're going to end our turn, so I'm just going to do a little bit of quick cleanup here. Grab these cubes out of the way. This needs to go to the arcane faction. This one to the beast faction. Pull this back. And we're going to hope for the best. So here's the conundrum that the blue player's in. We're trying to have the most relics and banners. We're, we've got two, the red player has one, and the chancellor has two. So we would have to get another one, and they're kind of hard to find. Uh, we could try to fight the red player for the banner of the people's favor. That's something, here, let me pull it over. That's something where you could target. I could target the red player for that. And their defense would be one die plus, or sorry, the number of dice is equal to the number of coins. So that would be two. But when you win this in a combat, that's when it gets seized. You would trash two of the coins that were on there and flip it over. And so um, it becomes a little bit tougher to hold on to. That does make me nervous. The other option is we do have these secrets here, which is nice. I could, remember there was that other vision, I could get that other vision instead of this one, and instead of this one, and just try to hold on to the banner of dark secrets. I'm not sure which is the better one to do necessarily, but either way, I probably want to journey over this way to the hinterland because I think that's where the vision was. I don't remember how far down it was, but I could look at this location. If I travel here, I could look, see if there's a relic there, and that could help me as well. So, I don't know. Either way, I'm starting my wake phase here, so I'm going to get a favor. And then let's do plan on moving over this way. So that travel is going to cost two. And we'll move over. And reveal, ah, there's no relic here. So maybe instead of going after relics, I mean, I could attack the blue player for relics, but probably what I want to do instead is what I was thinking of. Okay, so this is the Great Slum. It will hold three cards. Let's figure out what that is. This says, when playing or moving a card to this site, you may discard a card here first. So lots of cards could be held here. Three, plus we're going to have that ability. Let me reread how somebody might seize this. So it says, players can only recover this from you if there is a card at your site whose suit does not match any of your own advisors. So the reason I'm saying this is I almost wish I could get three secrets on here. Like if I could get three on here, that would be awesome. And it does say you can recover it from yourself or the shared bank freely. I'm not sure what that means that it's that it's happening freely. Is that just that I could put three? I'm going to look this up. I think maybe if I had three secrets, I could put them on there and just take the two back, but I'd have to have three to go. But my best understanding about me taking this for myself is I need to get three secrets and then I can have three on here, just making it that much tougher for other people to take, which would probably be important. So what I want to do, I will leave... I want to search and see if I could find that vision again. Like I said, I think it is here in the hinterland. So I'm going to go ahead and spend two. And we'll draw three. One, two, 
three. Okay, so not the vision. Where was that vision? I don't remember. Um, and then this one, okay, so this one, to spend a secret, take any one favor from the bank. Spend a secret if you hold the darkest secret. So that's probably gonna be really important for me as if by chance people wanna campaign against me. I don't know why they would, but that would be important. Um, and the great herd, when play, you may swap great herd with a, a nomad card at any site. Okay, so I think what I wanna do is hold on to this. I'm gonna discard these over here. Um, am I gonna play it here? Probably. I think so. I'm gonna go ahead and play it here, which will get me a coin from the arcane bank. But that wasn't the vision that I was hoping for. I don't remember where that ended up. But I do think it was at the hinterland, and that pile's really big. So I'm going to search one more time. I think, what do I, I don't even know what I have in my hand. I've got my vision, okay. And I have the book burning card. If you're victorious and targeted, the defenders and targeted the defenders pawn. I don't plan on doing that necessarily. Okay. Well, I think I want to. Okay. I think I want to search one more time. One. Oh, okay. There's a vision card. I think it's the only other one. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and discard this one. Let's bring this back. I can only have three cards. I'm gonna hold on to both visions just to be safe, and I'm gonna go ahead and discard this uh, like that. And I think I wanna to trade to get some secrets. Oh man, it's one per matching advisor though. I don't have a matching advisor. Ah, dang it. Okay, so that's not gonna work. I would need an arcane one, or no, I would need a discord one here or I would need to have an arcane one in my hand. I don't think that I rejected any of those. Well, darn it. How am I gonna get more secrets? I'm not totally sure, but I'm not stopping the red player from winning. And if I don't stop them, which I didn't, the purple player is gonna have to stop them. I'm kind of putting the pressure on them. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just as a backup plan, what if I go ahead and play this vision about holding on to the darkest secret to just say, hey, I'm gunning for this as well. And by this, I mean victory. And I'm not sure if it's useful, but I think the last thing I'm gonna do is muster just so that I've got some. I'll spend one to muster just to be safe, get those there. And with that, I think I'll end my turn. So I'm gonna go ahead and return this over here. I just realized I forgot to do this for the red player. The red player should be up here. And we have two, four, six, eight, nine. So we're gonna end up right here. And we will see what happens. I don't know that the, here's the thing. I don't know that the Chancellor could take both of us down. So in theory, in this next round, one of us or the other is going to be the winner, in theory. So what's the Chancellor gonna do? Well, going back to that citizenship thing, one option that they have, they could offer citizenship to one of us. I don't know that we are that prone to take it because, I mean, so, so for example, if we were to offer it to the red player, the red player would be giving up on their vision, but that's the thing that's gonna help them win. I mean, even if they didn't have this vision, they would need to survive one round and then they would win. So, I mean, they've kind of got a good hold on victory, but the red player is the one that you want to entice because they have so many war bands on the board that they those war bands would turn purple, but, the red player would only accept that if they could felt like they had more banners and more relics than anybody else, because that would ultimately lead them to victory. They don't have that. They just have the people's favor banner. So they're one behind everyone else. Like there's two over in purple and then there's the banner and the relic over in blue. So probably, I don't think that the chancellor would be able to woo the red player. They may be able to woo the blue player into accepting that uh, with considering the fact that the blue player, if they accepted, would have to have more relics and banners than the other players. And they currently have a banner and a relic and they would have a third, they would have another one. They would have three, 
which would beat the Chancellor and it would beat the Red player. But they would have to last two more rounds like that, where as it is right now, unless the Chancellor can stop him. So again, the Chancellor could maybe talk someone into becoming a citizen, but I think at this point, both the red player and the blue player would probably reject that just because they both have kind of victory on their tongue. Let's just take a quick look at some of the relics that are available. So if victorious in a battle, move all unkilled warbands in your enemy's force to Obsidian Cage. You'd move it here. And then as an action, the owner of this relic could move any number of warbands from the Obsidian Cage to any board of the same color. Okay, what does that mean? Any board of the same color? Oh, you just put them back? I guess, okay. I'm not sure what, I don't know how that's useful. I'd have to look more into that, I guess. Again, kind of the downfall of playing this the first time through the way they intended it to happen. I'm not super familiar. We looked at this whistle before, but it says, choose a pawn at another site. They must travel to your site if able, spending no supply. If they do, give them um, the secret that you put here. Hmm. Next, the Ring of Devotion. You cannot place warbands at sites. When mustering, you gain two more warbands. So wow, you could just hold on to tons and tons of warbands, but you wouldn't be able to place any warbands at sites. Hmm. Oh, I don't know. These relics are like, can, like how how would you use that? I guess you would just hold those on as defense, really. Just hold on to them so that you're protecting yourself a lot. Uh, cracked horn. You may put all of you may put all the cards you discard on the bottom of the world deck instead of in the normal discard pile. Yeah, I just don't think that. I don't think the Chancellor is going to be able to to help with either of those things. So probably our best hope is we have to stop the red player because then the red player would have to stop the blue player, otherwise the blue player gets victory. So I'm going to try to campaign against the red player, realizing they're the Oath Keeper, and yeah, I would have to, I would just have to take over one site because then it would go from three to four to four to three. We just have to take one site. That would at least pause them. In order to do that, I'm gonna have to muster. I don't have that many coins, but I've only got one coin. Gosh, I don't know. Um, okay, we're gonna take a risk. I'm gonna spend two supply in order to move up here. I could have, was this the one where I flip over the secret? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could take one of my secrets and flip it over, basically rendering it useless this round. And then during the rest phase, it, it flips back up. But I think I'm going to go here. And the reason I'm going to do that is I need coins. Now, whether I'm doing this action, so this action is I could put a secret on here and then discard that card um, in order to gain two from the matching favor bank. But I think I want to keep this card here. But that won't matter because, again, oh my gosh, so much is going on in my head. If I put this here, I would gain one coin plus one coin for each matching advisor that I have. I don't have that matching advisor. I have that one. So I would need to use that one for secrets to get two coins, and I could put this one here as an action for two coins. That would give me four coins. I could do a lot of mustering. I think that's what I'm going to do. So with the wolves, I'm doing a trade. So that was one supply. I put the secret on there. I'm gonna gain one plus one per matching advisor. That comes from the beast bank. And I'm going to do that action that I put the, I put the book on for. So now I think the way this works is we're going to discard this card even though it has a secret on it, that secret's gonna come back to us face down because it was already used, and this one goes over there. So we'll bring this back, and it stays face down to show that we've used it already. And then we would get two from the matching favor bank. Oh, there's only one coin on there. So I have to decide if I wanna undo that. I think, do you know what, I am gonna undo that, sorry. Let's bring this back here put this here. 
I'm just gonna do a normal trade because then I can keep these wolves around, which seem really nice as an action that I could use later. And, oh, sorry, I grabbed that. Instead of taking this one, I'm just trading secrets with this group, so I'm just gonna take the one coin from them. I guess, I don't really know what I'm doing. Oh, now I need to muster, but I can't muster because I just did all that stupid work. Ah, oh my gosh, why is this so hard on my brain? Okay, let me undo that again. We're learning as we go, it is so fun. Okay, I'm gonna bring this back. And the reason I'm bringing that back is because I'm gonna bring a coin from my board on here to use that as a muster action. Ugh, what a nightmare. Okay, so do I have enough that I would want to attack just the mountain? That's all I would need, I just need to stop them. I don't need to go crazy, I just need to stop them. I would be rolling four dice they would be rolling one die. Oh, I would lose a die, so it would be three. They would be rolling two dice. No, they would be rolling one die, but have two automatic adds to your defense. Oh my gosh, that's a little too close for comfort. What if I don't attack the mountain? What if I got out of there? I could. I have to take out red. Okay, can I muster anywhere else? I mean, yeah, I'm gonna lose the die for the mountain. I'm gonna gain one from the longbows. I could come down to the salt flats in hopes of picking this up, but the red player, well, no, they're not starting their turn there. The problem is that the red player rules this, and so they would get this defense ability, move any warbands to and from your board and any sites you rule, so they can shift things around however the heck they want to. So that sucks. They're gonna get that no matter what I'm doing. Oh my gosh. I don't know how the red player did this. I was smarter than I realized. I don't even think that I can travel necessarily because, well, I couldn't travel and muster. I could travel just to attack, but I couldn't travel and muster. This is so risky. I think I've got to have a backup plan. So probably what I want to do is I do want to campaign. I think I did this right. I traveled and then I didn't trade, I mustered, which was still one. I would spend two to campaign now. Let's see how that goes. <laughs> and then as a backup plan, as a backup plan as needed, I guess, I don't know. Then I have two more actions. So I am just attacking the mountains. So that's one defense die for red. And they will have these two here. Plus, because red is trying so hard to do this, we're also going to enact our battle plans here in just a second. But yes, the red player is my is the defender and the mountains is the target. So we're going to collect our dice. I get four attack dice, minus one for the mountains, plus one for the battle plan over there. This is a battle plan here too, but it has to do with if we're victorious. Um, so if victorious, we're going to gain one warband per enemy warband killed this campaign. Oh, yeah. The red player also has this battle plan, so they get to move any warbands to and from your board and any sites you rule except the last warband from a site. I think the red player knows they have to win this. So they're going to pull this, this, and this over here. <laughs> I don't know. They have to make it impossible for purple to win this. So I think we've got our battle plan set. Then the defense rolls. So they rolled nothing here, but they're gonna have five defense from the five warbands that are right there. And I was, oh, do you know what? They actually get one more die. And I had been, I just wanted to say, I was debating this here, but I see that the red player still has more they could campaign again, so I'm really trying to save those. But I do need to roll one more die because we're the Oath Keeper. So let's do that. Oh, that was blank. Okay, so five defense for red. We have to beat five. Let's see what happens. We do have four warbands war here, but I have to be able to also rule them. So let's see. Oh, wow. Okay, so we did manage to win, but we did lose two warbands along the way because we had six here. Two of them died automatically, but we don't have to kill any more because that puts us at six, which beats the defenders five. Oh my gosh, so we did take the mountain. 
Now this was their force, these five, so they're gonna lose two. Two of them die, they lose half rounded down, and they move these back. So they'll keep these ones here, but these are here, like this. And since the red player lost two war bands, that means we gained two war bands because of our cauldron. Assuming I did that right. And I'm not exactly sure on the timing of this. It says, if you're victorious, like I think I can include these two as I go put them up there. Uh, I guess I'm gonna add three. And again, I could be wrong about the timing of that, but having done that, now I rule four sites. The red player rules three. I get to take this, and even if I ended my turn right here, the red player would not be able to win due to the vision. So my question is, how do I spend those last two? Do I campaign one more time? I don't have much going for me. I've only got the one warband, which I guess is an argument for me keeping. Do you know what? Let me pull one of those back. Like... I could attack other locations they have, especially that one that they're using to defend. Oh, but the problem is, I don't think I want to do that. If I attack them again, if they're the defender again, they still have this dumb warning signals card. So they could put all of these back on the board. So I think two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. 10, 12, with two left, I could just restock all the way up here and hope for the best. I would love to muster again, but I would have to travel in order to muster, and I don't have enough, I can't do both. I can travel, but I wouldn't be able to muster. Do you know what I may have to do though? Maybe I'll search. I think I will. I think I will. I need some advisors. Oh, there's only one card here. It's the only card that was there, so I've got it. And as an action, I can, oh! I don't know how much that helps me. Okay, well, no, it has to be played to the location. Dang it, I was hoping I could keep this and use it now to gain two supply. That would have to be played to the location, but that location's full. So I'm just gonna keep that as a face down advisor, and I'm gonna go ahead and end my turn. If I remember right, I'm restocking up to here, and this goes back here, and this comes to me, and here, let me get rid of those while we're at it, but yes, this comes back. Ooh, okay. And I don't remember if one of these was face down or should have stayed that way, I don't know. But we'll go back like that. Okay, that was a close call from the Oath Keeper. It also does put the red player into a really sticky situation. They have to get the Book of Secrets or the Banner of Secrets from the blue player or the blue player is going to win. There are two ways I could go about this. I could attack the banner. So I would have to go to the blue player's location and I could attack that. I could try to seize it, and when I do, it burns some of the secrets on there, making it, again, easier to take. But it says players can only recover this from you, so that's from here, if there is a card at your site whose suit does not match any of your advisors. Oh my gosh, why is this one so hard for me to understand? Players can only recover this from you, this person, if there is a card at your site, if there is a card, whoa, from you, if there is a card at your site whose suit does not match any of your advisors. Right now, there's the arcane card, doesn't match any of the advisors, so this is up for grabs. Man, I've been misinterpreting that the whole time. Good question if I'm gonna go back and uh, clarify. So I guess if I had my head on straight, I would have wanted one of these, this is from that location, I would want one of these as my advisors but I don't have one, so that is up for grabs. Why, why is that so hard for me to read? So I could go to his location and try to combat him for it, or I could um, just try to take it by getting more secrets on it than what he has now. So to combat, I'd have to be on his location to try to take the banner away from him. You can almost imagine that's like a physical thing. Or I could not be at his location and just try to gain more dark secrets and I would not have to be at his location. All I would do is the, rec the recover action, um, which I think is the direction I'm going to go because I don't, I want to save my mustering and all of that stuff. I want to save that for fighting against the purple player and not necessarily against the blue player. 
to do this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spend two supply to travel. And I'm gonna go from here down to the wastes. The reason I'm doing this is because the old oak is here, which says if trading with old with the old oak, gain one secret, and we're gonna gain one more secret if you have any of the beast advisors, which we do have. So I'm gonna go ahead and trade now for one, which will let me, um, sorry, I gotta put two coins on there, and then I'm gonna get two secrets in return. And again, normally in this kind of a trade, you would only be looking at the board, like you'd only be looking at your cards to see if you have a matching advisor. But in this case, the old oak gives you the additional secret. Now I have three secrets, which I can use to do the recover action. So I'm gonna spend one to recover. And the way that this works is we're gonna put these three new secrets on the board. And here, I'll put it here because we have to follow the complicated dialogue. So then the new holder must place more than is on the board, which we just did. And then the new holder of this is gonna get one secret and all of the rest will go to the old player. So we're gonna take this back and, oh, and these three need to stay on here. And I got this one in my hand. And there we are. All right, as a free action, because I am nervous about the three places that I am currently holding, I'm gonna take three, ooh, am I gonna take more? Hold on. First, oh, I wanted to muster, but I can't because I've already used this card as an action. I, could I, ooh, I might just do a quick reverse before I moved and took all of that. I might have, I think what I'll do, yeah. Before I would have moved, let me just rewind a little bit. I know that's such a dumb thing to do, but keep in mind how I'm trying to keep three characters under control. So before I would have moved, let me go ahead and muster, and then I'll move because I knew I was going to trade down here. And I'll be using the wolves to muster, so I'm just going to go ahead and put a coin on there. And the reason I wanted to especially use the beast action, like I, I couldn't have mustered over where I am now because I already used that action. But the reason why I wanted to do that is because with my animal playmates, I don't have to spend supply and I can just muster and get the two for the one coin. Now I have enough. I think I'm gonna go ahead and put, oh, I don't know how much I should. Let me go ahead and put two war bands on each location. This is a free action. You can move uh, war bands to and from your board as you want, and that's free. But at least then I'm really holding on to those three places. And with that, I plan to end my turn. So we're gonna go ahead and take all of these coins and they go back to the beast bank. And we've only got four war bands over here, but we do have the extra supply. So we will be starting here next turn. So the blue player was so close to winning the game, but not quite. Now it's their turn. As I'm looking at this, I don't think, I think I should have done this and I forgot to. I'll go try to annotate that just a little behind the scenes. It has been a week and a half since I started recording this video. It's taking so long. Um, and I have other things going on in my life. But during the rest of the action, I should have taken a coin from the Chancellor because I'm pretty sure at the end of my last turn the red player did have the Oath Keeper. Um, they were the Oath Keeper. So I think I should have done that. And if not, sorry, but I'm pretty sure that's right. But what I do want to say is that we obviously didn't win. We're still trying to hold on to the Darkest Secret. Just to review, we do also have this vision over here that would, if we wanted to, allow us to swap out the vision and aim for having the most relics and banners but uh, we're down to one relic where the red player has two banners and the purple player has two banners or the chancellor now one thing worth considering for the blue player is this is the last unruled place as much as i don't totally care about ruling maybe i do want to take this place back so i I probably like I definitely the red player has the darkest secret banner so they're probably going to come for this place maybe successfully but what I'd like to do is let's at least try to control it just so then we can hold on to this card here I mean control it by ruling it you know what I'm saying 
So I am going to go ahead and spend two supply to combat. I will be combating the, uh, oh my gosh, what are they called? The bandits. I think I really only want to hold on to the one location. I don't feel like I need to go crazy and try to fight elsewhere necessarily. Well, not only that, I have to fight the bandits. I couldn't even attack other places unless I was on a spot where I could name them as a defender. So I'm just going to go for the bandits. We're going here. We get five dice. I really think we're going to keep this nice and easy and straightforward. Um, I don't think there's any modifiers. Technically, the bandits rule this card, but they don't ever use battle plans that require a cost. So I think that's just the way it's going to be. So they're going to roll this. Oh, and they have a times two. Two times zero is zero. But they'll just have the one warband that's sitting here. So they have one defense. If I can't defeat that, that's a real problem. So we'll go ahead and roll. Yeah, all right. So, oh, we got definitely killed. But we did lose one of our warbands in the process. And that was fine. So now I'm going to go ahead and put two of my warbands on the board so that I control this spot. Now I have to decide how I want to go about getting the darkest secret banner back, assuming that's what I want to do. I would need to have four secrets in order to do that. Or I could try to fight for them. If I went up here, I could just try to fight the red player to take them. They don't have very much defense holding like with them. Like they've only got one warband on their board, but I could go up here. But when, if I were to come up here and declare combat, I would also have to be battling this spot, which has three warbands there. Um, how do I want to go about doing this? The other scary thing about doing that is, I mean, combating. They do have this warring, well, warning signals card, which would allow them to take warbands from here and go over there. If they wanted to do that, maybe they wouldn't do that because they're trying to hold strong against the purple player and blue player's not really a threat. So I think the intimidation factor is probably influencing the blue player to the point that they don't necessarily want to do that. So what I'm gonna wanna do is find out how I can get, how I can get two more secrets. I can't really get two secrets where I am because the only card there is this arcane card. And remember, it would take two coins, plus I would have to have a matching suit in order to gain any secrets. Um, I could, if I had a beast card, travel up to the old oak, so I could do a search. Now, if I search from the world deck, it would cost four supply, which is probably too much. If I had the darkest secret banner, it would only be two supply, because that's the, that's the power that it grants. So as it is, maybe what I just do is a search from the Hinterland discard pile, which will cost two. I think I'm going to run out of supply to do what I need to do or what I want to do. Okay, so wait, we draw one, two, three. There's no visions. Take a look. Ooh, okay. Well, I probably want to hold on to the Inquisitor so that I can at least get one secret. Um, we have this Battle Honors card. If you're victorious, gain two coins from the order bank faithful friend when you when played you gain four supply immediately um and then the inquisitor i don't even know that i necessarily care about the ability we'll read it but i care about that okay peek at an advisor well at an advisor of a player whose pawn is at your site if it is the conspiracy okay so the conspiracy is a vision card i believe that's not in the first game that I know of. I think it comes in in the second game. So I, I don't necessarily need that, but I do want this suit. So I'm going to go ahead and discard these two cards to the cradle, and we're going to play this one to ourselves, not to the site, because I need the matching suit. That will also help me because it is a matching suit, which is that thing that I was so confused about where I could hold on to the dark secret, assuming no more suits come into play in the great slums. So I'm gonna hold on to that. And now I want to do a trade. So the trade action is one supply. We're gonna do a trade. And remember that just means we gain one book per matching advisor. So we're going to just get the one secret. So I'm down to one supply. I need one more secret before I can secure 
that book. <sighs> but I'm also going to have the problem of if the red player stays where they are, they have that one suit, which remember, players can only recover this from you if there is a card. Wait, did I get it backwards? Players can only recover this from you if there is a card at your site whose suit does not match any of your advisors. Sir. Yeah, that's I was right. So as long as they are there and they have this playmates, they are protected. But maybe they'll move. I don't know. Thinking about these three is really hurting my brain. So I probably also want to build maybe some defense. Do I muster a little bit? Um, let's think. I have two, four, six, eight, ten advisors. If I muster, I'd go down to eight. I'd go here. So here's what I'm thinking. If I end now, I would get all the way resupplied. If I spend my one supply to muster, then I'm only going to supply up to here. So I think I'm just going to stop my turn. Let's end it right there. So the coins are going to go over here to the arcane bank. And we would normally go up to 9 plus, but we do have an extra to spare, so we are going to be all the way resupplied. That will bring us to the next round, so we are going to move here. Now in the next round, if the Chancellor still has the Oath Keeper thing, then we would roll the die, and on a 6, the game would end, the Chancellor would be the winner. So their big goal right now is to hold on, hold on to the sites that they've got, and if we could take over one more site, that would make it even tougher for anyone to take the Oath Keeper. So um, I kind of want to just focus on that, I think. Maybe let's try to take over a spot. Um, it's been so long since I've been here. I don't remember what this is. What is this and why am I holding on to it? Okay, has to be played to a location. Gain two supply for a coin. You know, that's not terrible. Maybe I do want to get that thing out. Just playing a card from your face down advisors to a location is a free action. This location's full, so I could not play it here. But there are plenty of places that they can go. What if I just try to come down here and take over the, the buried giant? From there, I could spend one of my secrets to travel anywhere. So that seems like a pretty good spot to go. But I am going to want to muster first. Maybe even muster twice because of that. Unfortunately, I only have one coin. Ugh, thinking is so much hardness. I guess what I'm going to do is let's start with a... Hi. Let's start with a trade, right? Yeah, okay. We're gonna start with a trade. I'm going to put a secret with the wolves. Yeah, so a trade is gonna cost one supply. Let's put a secret on the wolves and that will get me one coin automatically plus one coin for matching advisor. So I'll get two coins. I'm just gonna grab them right here from the beast bank then I'm going to go ahead and muster. So that's going to cost one supply and one coin. And sorry, I don't know why these are still here. Um, two. Now I think I want to muster again, but uh, I'm not going to have enough supply. All right, so what we're going to do next is let's travel. That costs two supply. I'm moving down here. Yeah, so two supply. Though, wouldn't it be nice to actually have this location down here so that I could use the warning signal? Oh, it would be nice, but again, the red player, they could just pull their forces, which makes me nervous. Well, they're going to be able to do that anyway because because they rule this site. So do you know what? Let's do. Let's try to take over. We're going to come down here. We're going to try to take over the salt flats so that I can get access to this warning signals. I know that it sucks that the red player gets that for now. That's okay. Because I could still do a couple of things here. Oh, well, okay. Sorry, I have so many things in my brain and not enough supply to do it. Here, let's see how this plays out. I think I'm thinking in the right way. As a free action, I'm gonna go ahead and play this card out. And that's going to gain me one coin from the hearth faction. And that was a free action. 
Now also as a free action, I'm gonna put this coin here to gain two supply. And then I'm gonna use the warning signals card. I'm gonna place, I'm gonna spend one supply to muster. And I'm going to go ahead and attack. I'm gonna campaign against the red player. So I gotta choose my target. Well, choose the defender. The defender is the red player. I'm gonna aim right here. And so they're gonna get one die here. I'm just, I'm just gonna go after this one location. Well, where am I gonna go after two locations? The reason why I say that is because if I'm attacking two places, like if I'm only attacking one, they're gonna pull so many forces to this one spot. If I'm attacking two, well, it won't make a difference, I guess, either way. No, let's just attack the one place. I think we'll, I don't know. How am I thinking about that strategically? I think let's, let's just attack the one place. So they'll have the one defense die. Oh, I already did that. They'll have the one defense die, and then um, they will have a chance to use this card to pull more in. For us, we have the starting six dice for the starting warband. Plus, because we still rule the longbows, we get an additional die. We're not attacking the mountains. The mountains have nothing to do with this battle, so we're not losing a die. So now the red player, we have a chance to use these battle cards. So it says move any warbands to and from your board and any sites you rule except the last warband from a site. The red player recognizes that this battle is gonna be really important. So I do think that they're gonna pull these in. I think, oh, I don't know. I am not a strategic mind. But at the very least, that's like seven victory spot, like that's seven uh, defense that gets added no matter what happens with this die. And the blue player, or what, the, per, the, <laughs> the attacker, only rolls seven dice. Oh gosh, I don't know. I don't know how this is gonna play out. But basically, I think we have all of our dice in order, so we're gonna go ahead and roll this one. They would love a double shield. Nope, they didn't get that. So all they have are these right here. And again, I wanna point out that we couldn't attack the pond because the pond is over here, so we were just attacking this land. So they have seven defense. Okay, so let's see if we can beat seven. We got seven dice. Plus we have these over here that we can sacrifice as needed. I don't think, yeah, I don't have anything else. Okay. All right, so that was one, two, three, four, five. I need to beat seven, so six, seven, eight would end up getting us to victory. It's pretty deadly but I think it had to happen that way. So the defender loses half, rounded down, so that would be three. These are gonna just go into the pile where these go back to the board. Sorry, that wasn't very clear. These go to the board. They lost half of these. I don't think they had any other cards that were gonna help them necessarily, so these just get lost. And that wasn't great for the red player. They might have to change things up a little bit. And of the war bands we have remaining, we get to choose what we want to put over there. Let's take these two. They go here, and we are out of supply. I don't plan on traveling anymore. Why am I having such a hard time keeping things cleaned up? Um, and I think that will just end the purple player's turn. So we're gonna put this over here, put this right here. Oh, this one here this comes back and let's see we've got two four six eight ten eleven so we are here all right so the red player we're gonna have a lot of things to think about but first of all on the wake phase we must put a coin there which we can't so otherwise we're gonna have to lose a coin uh let's see so it goes to the bank with the least amount of favor and then yeah Something I'll have to go investigate is what happens if there is no coin on that? Is it just super easy to take? I would guess. I might have to look that up. Okay, who has the least? Oh, it's the order faction. All right, so a couple of things that we can consider doing. 
We can obviously fortify the places we've got. Probably a good thing to do. I really have to decide which way that I want to go about what we're doing. Like, how much do I just try to fortify what I've got? How much am I going after the purple player? Do I go after the blue? Oh man, I don't know what to have the red player do. But it might be a good idea to search. Maybe I could get an additional one of these. I can protect the banner of the darkest secret from the blue player by staying at a site whose suits match the suits that I've got. So like, I could just stay where I am and be safe, but there's not a lot for me here. There is still this relic over here, which we can look at. I don't, I don't remember what it is. Sticky fire, if you're victorious, you may kill all of the war bands in your enemy's force. If you do, you must give them a coin if able. I don't, hmm. Kind of do want that, but I don't know that I want to burn two secrets to get that necessarily. I'm totally out of coins, so I could, you know, make a trade with the old oak for some coins. What would that do? Well, how about this? At the very, well, I don't have any coins at all. Crap. This isn't good. This is not good. Okay, let's start here. As a free action, you can trade, you, know, you can put war bands to, move war bands to and from your board. It reminds you of that right here. So we can't, wait, where is it? Move war bands between your board and your site if you rule it. So yeah. Let's start here. Next, I want to travel over to the mountains. I just don't know which place yet. If I go to the mountains, if I do any kind of attack against the purple player, I'm going to lose an attack die to do that. But they have cards up here that I could use to gain some favor. Oh wait, I just mustered no, I didn't muster. I just moved. Okay. So I think what I need to do is come down here. I've got to recuperate a little bit. Let's start by putting these two war bands up. Oh man. Oh, I want to search, but there's nothing in the discard pile, but that's okay. Oops, I should do my travel. That's okay because, because I hold the darkest secret, it's still just to supply to search from the world deck. Here's the world deck right here. Oh, and there's a vision. I don't know what that's gonna be. So we've got the Rangers. This would be a good one. Uh, I could ignore all skulls that I roll. Oh, wow, plus two attack die if the defense has a pool of four or more dice that they're rolling. That seems nice. Okay, the vision of the rebellion. Wake, if you win if you hold the people's favor and at least three visions have been drawn. Ah, oh, okay. That's kind of helpful, but I don't have favor tokens here. I would need to get, like, I'm about to lose that anyway. So I think I'm just gonna discard this, this one, and I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna play this one to the location. That will help protect, oh, that'll help protect, because it's this suit, the Banner of Darkest Secrets from the blue player. Then, I need coins, so I'm gonna do a trade. So I'm gonna do a trade, put this on there, and I'll gain one coin for doing the trade initially and another coin because I have the matching suit. And again, those matching suits are gonna protect the darkest secrets. So now I've got two coins. And oh, I can't muster. I want to muster so badly, but I'm stuck there. And I don't have enough supply to really go anywhere else. I think I'm gonna end my turn there. Two, four, six, seven, plus I'll have the extra one. Okay, yeah, this is not going well. It's probably at one of these moments that I might start talking to the chancellor about, hey, can I become a citizen? You can have all of my war bands. The problem is we've got these two banners. They have these two relics and I would need to have more than them. I could attack the blue player and try to get their relic. Ooh, that's an interesting prospect. I'm thinking about that. But as we clean up, we're gonna bring this back. I mean, there's not much for me to think about. Citizenship has to be offered to me, but the way I kind of read it is I could plant the seed in the purple player's brain, maybe? But heck, they might win this next round anyway. One out of six chance, we'll see. And I just realized I forgot to move this up with the vision, so I got that part. All right, blue player, 
our goal oh, is to get the banner of the darkest secret which we can't because they're protected by that rangers card so is there any way i can get rid of that rangers card and i might also have considered trying to talk the purple player into letting me, me become a citizen but i don't even think that would matter so much because i do have the card with the same goal as the oath keeper you know the successor goal and i'm not even feeling very confident about that i know that there was another vision just barely drawn i could look at that and see if that's worthwhile i guess my initial thought is it couldn't hurt necessarily the tricky thing is i would love to get i could get another secret but until i move the red player i i can't i would have to battle them over it but they're kind of protected at that spot let's see what that discarded vision was so i'm going to go ahead and search the discard pile all we're doing is drawing this card we as the viewers already know this is the people's favor vision which is more easily attainable than the darkest secret so maybe i need to switch goals um do i do that i could do that um let's try to take the people's favor vision i want to do that maybe we give up the darkest secret okay so we can go ahead and replace this is my understanding with this card i could even discard that one if i wanted to but i'm going to go ahead and hold on to that so i'm just going to go ahead and take this it gets discarded over to the cradle the red player should be feeling nervous before I recover the people's favor, let's get more coins on it to make it harder for other people to take it from me. And so the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna go ahead and trade. And I'm grabbing two coins from the arcane stack, one for the actual trade and one because I have a matching advisor. So now I've got four. Is that enough coin to feel confident recovering? There's not very much money out there for people to use. So I think I am gonna go for, oh man, it would be nice if I had one more, but no, we'll, we'll stick with that. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna do the recover action and I'm gonna take these four coins and we put more that were on here than before. And then we're gonna put the old one in the favor banks one by one starting with any suit. So we're gonna put four coins on here and claim it. And again, my understanding of the word when seized flip is that happens after a battle like you seize it with a battle i believe um okay so we've got those this goes into where does it say we get to start start it on any bank um i don't know it's kind of nice that the people can't use these i'm gonna go ahead and put this on the discord faction probably again i'm still trying to wrap my head around that issue and with that I think I want to take a search action. I'm going to search the discard pile. Just see if I could find something else that's going to help me. I have enough space for one more advisor. Oh, one, two, three. Or, obviously, the location has plenty of spaces. Okay. Well, good thing is these are suits that I care about. When played, if the ruler's pawn is not at this site, kill any warbands at the site, then gain a warband and place it here. Wow! That's a great one uh, if I wanted to do that. But like if I was up here, that would have been fantastic and mean. Okay, <clears throat> sleight of hand. Well, hold on. Sorry, that was weird. Something stuck in my throat and it's still there a little bit. Okay, sleight of hand as an action. Take a secret from a player whose pawn is at your site. You cannot take their last secret. Okay, or keep plus two defense if the site is targeted i want that one. Oh man that thing is still in my throat i'm going to discard these two we're going to play this here which will gain me a coin the last coin from the order faction and i think we're going to call that good so let me just grab the secret from this card right here bring it back oh no 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 before i do that sorry that is really bizarre i don't know what's happening um okay <clears throat> we'll we're gonna survive this what i wanted to do is with this last one i want to trade one more time oh no maybe i don't want to do this because uh 
they don't have any more coins. So I wouldn't be able to get any more coins. No, I'll take that back. Okay, we'll just end the turn. So I was here and we have two, four, six, eight. Oh, do I want to muster? That's what I want to do with my last one. Let's go ahead. I'm going to put this on the arcane one because this book was over here so that we can muster. And then I'm going to get the coin back. Oh my gosh, could I do this a million times? Just to make sure that we're nice and protected. No, I don't even want to do that. Oh my gosh, Tom, think these things through. I need a coin so that I can keep the people's favor. Fine, fine. We will put these back. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that throat thing really threw me off. Okay, where was I? Two, four, six, eight, ten. But we have one extra, so we're going up here. Wahoo. Let's freaking end that turn. Now, we're going to change the round marker. So this is could be the moment that the game ends or maybe we have another round maybe we got another three rounds we'll, well one two three okay <clears throat> so we're rolling if this is a six because the chancellor has the oath keeper title the game would end nope okay so it didn't end so let's go ahead and put this die here next time we roll they need a five or a six so we've got at least one more round here the purple player has to muster we're going to muster before I forget, let's, and so I don't confuse myself, let's go ahead and start by doing a free action. Well, no supplies, but I'm going to spend this coin to take this action here. One thing I need to remember is that I can kill any one warband. Like, I rule that site, so I could take this action over here. I just haven't wanted to use my secrets in that way. Oh, there's probably not been opportunities where I could have and should have done either of these actions, having ruled that site, even though I'm not there. It's just hard to keep track of everything. But by putting this coin here, not just because my pawn's there, but because I rule it, oh, I also get to pick up this coin at the beginning of my turn uh, for this location. So I'm going to gain two supply. That was several thoughts all at the same time. Okay, so we're going to gain two supply. That should help. Now I'm going to go ahead and use my warning signals card to and this coin in order to muster. So that was that. Okay, next we're going to want to travel. Mostly so we could muster some more and maybe we're going to want to take out some more red locations. You know, just to be extra, extra, super duper safe. But mostly I would love to just get a lot of warbands on the board. In fact, maybe while we're here, let's drop one of these off for free and decide where we're traveling. We just want to travel somewhere where we can get stuff. Um, let's actually travel over here and we'll use the old oak. Well, I don't need secrets, I need coins. So never mind. I don't want to go there. Let's go up here. I don't want to discard the wolves card because that's benefiting me. So I am just going to go ahead and do a normal trade with the wolves. Um, oh, that's going to be one supply. Oh, so two to travel, one here. <coughs> Oh no, the beasts don't have any money. They're bankrupt. So they can't give us money for a trade. Oh no, the arcane faction has money, but we don't have another advisor. And there's no coins in the discard pile. This is not the place I wanted to go. Okay, I had spent two to go here. I lied, we're gonna go over here. A nice safe haven <laughs> that way. And then let's use either of these cards to go ahead and trade. Oh, the order faction is bankrupt too. Why are people taking my money? I don't have money to muster. How in the freak am I going to get money to muster? I just gave my money away. Why didn't I think of that? Where can I go to get money? I really wanted to search. All of the cards are here at the cradle. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm not trading. I'm not trading. So what the heck have I even done so far? I gained a supply. That was a free action. I think I started... I don't remember where I started. <laughs> crap i don't know if i'm right here oh well i'm just gonna roll with it i feel like i started here i used one to muster and two to travel now i'm gonna spend two to search one two and then there's a vision visions aren't really helpful for the chancellor but we can keep them away from the other players so vision of faith if you win oh you and if you hold the darkest secret we would like to keep that out of the red player's hand, so maybe I hold on to it. Let's look at what these other ones are. Play to a location when played if the ruler's pawn... Oh, we already saw these, right? If the ruler's pawn is not at this site, then kill any warbands and place one here. 
that would be very useful if I had more supply. I could go to the wastes. Yeah. Um, well, I don't have to go there. I could just do it. Oh my gosh, I could do that. That's a mean card. That seems very powerful. Okay. Interesting. Okay, and then this one, sleight of hand. Take a card from a player whose pawn is at your site. Or take a secret. Uh, you cannot take their last secret. Okay. Do you know what I think we're going to do? Is let's keep this one on top because it clogs up the deck. I'm going to put this here is where it's discarded. And I think... Oh, well, we have to play this to our location. So maybe I just want to hold on to this and travel over to the wastes. Is that worthwhile? Oh, I want to do that so badly, but mostly I've got to keep that card out of the red player. Oh, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to change that up. I'm going to hold on to this vision, and maybe I'll travel over and pick this card up in a little bit. But for now, let's hold on to this. Keep it away from the red player as long as we can. We have the space for it. I do have one more. Should we... I can't muster. I don't have any coins. I have no money. I can't even sell my secrets to the order faction because they don't have any money either and that's where i am in my location so i think what i have to do is just end my turn right here two four six eight nine not a lot we're going here plus we had one more so this goes here to the nomads this goes here to the hearth so now here we are with the red player what are they going to do to get themselves closer to victory they um if we had another secret, we could use this action to get four coins. That's still not enough. Oh yeah, we've got to be stopping the blue player. It's still not enough to get that banner from the blue player. Unless I had five coins. I could spend one. No, I would have to spend two. Oh, okay, that has to be my goal. Otherwise, the blue player is going to win. How do I stop them? I can try to fight them for that banner. But I don't have tons of units with me i could i could pull from my current board to try to get them what would that have to, okay let's think about this what would that have to look like i would have to spend two coins in order to get one more secret in order to get four coins that's still not enough i would have to have five coins to take the banner <sighs> one longer about way to do this is i could go up here spend two travel up here discard the wolves card as an action, so I'd spend my secret to discard the wolf's card to gain two favor from uh, the beast bank, but the beast doesn't have any money. So a different option is I could pull some of these back, travel down to the slums, declare them a target, and fight them for the banner. What would that take? So pull out, that's two supply to travel. I would have three war bands on me. The tricky part is the number of dice that are here is, um, sorry, the number of dice for this would be however many coins are in here. So that alone gets four coins. Plus, they would be battling us at our location. We would get our dice. We would have these four dice, plus they would be attacking us. So we've got these two dice here. Plus, they would have to also be going after our location. That's another die there plus all of the war bands included with all of that. So if we were going to do that, we would have to have quite the force with us. But I honestly don't know that there's any other option because the beasts and the arcane, well, there is money with the arcanes if I was going to try to get more. Like if I wanted to go sell this secret, I could either go sell that secret to an arcane faction in order to get two coins. Still not enough. I don't know, I think that battle might be the best thing to do. Let's try it. We haven't tried that yet, this game, I don't think. So I'm going to start with a muster. Okay, muster. We rule this site, too. Oh, do you know what? I Maybe I don't want to muster because maybe I want to spend the coin on this card. Because they're going to be rolling so many dice, so that would get us plus two, plus we could ignore the skulls. Okay, I don't want to muster on this card. I don't want to. So instead, what we're going to do, did I spend, I think, did I spend one to trade? I keep losing track of that. Okay, no. Hold on, I'm going to review the footage. 
Okay, yeah, I was right. I was, my supply should be on the nine. But the first thing I wanna do is I wanna gather some more bands. Next, so I was here. I'm gonna spend two to travel. I'm heading here. Next, I need to muster. So I'm gonna actually muster twice, I believe, to get four like this. Now, really quickly, my understanding is, even though there are cards on here, the blue player could still use these cards as they defend. Like, this won't apply so much, but if the blue player had a book, they could go ahead and still defend themselves. I don't I don't think that I don't think that the red player's using of this card during their turn would stop the blue player if this applied to them from de from using that to defend. Cuz usually having stuff on there makes things inert, but I yeah, that's my best understanding. I'll I'll look it up, but that makes sense to me. But get ready. Um, we did not, yeah, we were mustering, but we didn't, we didn't have a beast card around. We're going to go ahead and spend these last two to campaign. It's going to be a mess. I'm sure there's going to be a mistake. I'm going to do the best I can, but I am declaring the blue player a target. I am attacking the great slum and I'm going after the banner and I'm going after, uh, do I want to attack them personally? I don't. I don't see a need to do that. I just want the banner, and because I'm at the location that the blue player rules, I do have to attack them. I don't think that I care about attacking them personally. I don't think so. But by attacking the banner, it has four coins on it, so that's going to be four dice, plus the die for this location. And we'll get to it, but we're going to talk about the battle cards and all of that stuff here in a second. But they're going to get two more dice. I'm just really carefully trying to follow the sequence here. So we're going to also collect the attacker's dice. So that's going to be three, four, five, six, seven dice for them. Now we need to check all of the battle plans that apply. Remember, battle plans come from relics or advisors or sites you rule. The reason I say that is, sure, this could be used to advantage the red player, but the blue player rules this, so that's why the red player can't use it. The blue player does rule this spot, and it's free. It's actually a keep, so it's going to add two dice. I only have one more die, so I'm going to have to try to remember to roll one of those dice twice. The red player is going to go ahead and spend... Oh my gosh, the dumb coin. I was saving a coin. Hold on. Um... Uh, Crap, I had mustered twice. Let me unmuster. Oh my gosh, it's so here it is so hard to track what I'm doing <laughs> when I record. I'm bringing this one die back. I'm unmustering. I needed that coin. I just forgot I needed that dumb coin. Okay, so bring those two, which will lose me two dice. And in my brain, I think this is worth it. Oh, and that would put me here. This has got to be worth it because these rangers are going to add the two dice that I was just barely missing, plus I'm gonna be ignoring any skulls that I roll, which will be really important for me. So these two dice are back. Oh my gosh, why is money so tight right now? Other than that, we don't have any battle plans here. They don't have any over here. I think I've got this right. Of course, I might have a mistake somewhere. And so we're gonna roll the defense, but I need to remember that we're rolling one of these dice twice. Holy... Oh my gosh, that did not work for the red player. Here's a nice times two over here. Cause they have two, four, six, eight times two plus one more roll. So we're at eight, <laughs> 10. Okay, so they have 20 just rolled defense, <laughs> which is insane. Plus they have uh, one, two, and I'm pretty sure that this doesn't have any like war bands on it. Like these would only count, I think, if I was attacking the player, which I'm not. So I think I'm at 22 defense. Uh, yeah, good luck, red player. It's not going to happen. So with these seven dice. Okay, so we're ignoring. That was actually a pretty great roll. It's not going to be enough. But um, we ignore the skulls, so that'd be two, four, six, eight, ten, and a half. And I, if I chose to, I could go 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. It still won't be enough because that roll was so 
so crazy. Oh my gosh. The red player managed to hold on to the banner. So all that happened is the red player lost half rounded down. Oh my gosh, you guys, I think the blue player just won this. Because I don't see any way that the red player could stop. Can they? Oh my gosh, I cannot believe that roll. That's going to go down in infamy. It's going to go down into some book somewhere about something. And I've been standing here for a little while thinking, is there any way to stop this? And I don't think that there is. There's nothing I can do with that last one that would make any difference. I'm really glad that I kind of undid all that crap to use the coin to stop the death because that there were like, what, three or four of those that <laughs> rolled? That would have been really bad. Okay, well, I really don't see any way that the red player can stop anything at this point. Like, the only thing I could do with this last supply is a trade. I could muster and get two of them back, but oh no, I don't even have any coins to do that. I could trade my secret and get one coin. Nope. I don't, I don't see it. I don't see it happening. Two, four, two, four, six, seven, plus one more. I think that was it. But look, the beasts have a coin. Woohoo. Oh, and Arcane has more. And now it is the wake phase of the blue player's turn. You win if you hold the people's favor banner. And at least three visions have been drawn. That is the case. So the blue player just won. Just because I'm a nerd, because the blue player wouldn't have been able to get more. I just want to see what would have happened if we got to the next round. Oh, and that would have ended it, and the purple player would have won. But as it is, victory to the blue player. Congratulations. That was kind of exciting. That was more exciting than it should be. Um, let me just give a couple of quick thoughts and then remind you that there is a whole process to the cleanup of this game if you want to do this rolling game idea. So I will cover that, which means I can't really touch anything on the board um, at this point. So I will do another video, but just really quickly, some thoughts about Oath. Number one, um, I think that the way that they teach you this game is good, but a little bit deceiving. In the rule book, they kind of say that you can basically just open up the game and, and learn as you go. I think that's like 30% true. There is no way that I would have known what was happening if I had just followed that first round. As I mentioned, I still struggled and I read the book four times, I think, and watched some videos and I was on BGG looking up questions that I had. Like I did a lot of research and I still struggled a little bit. So I really don't think you can just open up and play as you go. Um, I really think that at least one person has to know what they're doing. They have to know it really well. And in that case, you would get to decide if you wanna do the walkthrough of the first couple of rounds. Uh, I mean, I know this is biased and kind of dumb. I like the way that I did it for this video in that we did a whole, on, whole introduction explaining everything and then we used the scripted turns to just solidify stuff we had already talked about. We practiced our knowledge with one or two more rounds, and then I added in the more complicated citizenship stuff. That's how I would do it from here on out. Um, I really like that there is a lot of unique things. Well, okay, I'm conflicted. There are, There is some really tough vocabulary here. And that always frustrates me. Like, that's what kept me out of, um, what was it, Net Ro Net Runner, Android Net Ro Runner. That game had, the vocabulary was too crazy to learn. This one has a lot of really tough vocabulary, hard to wrap your head around. That just makes the entry level tougher. And little things like, like, I can see now why they're doing what they're doing a little bit with the discarding, like you've got to discard to a different province. That just helps with the searching. It helps keeps cards moving. Really fascinating what happens. The way they control the world deck here is by making it more and more expensive as you get deeper into the game. And they're kind of locking you into these cards for the most part. Sure, maybe a card or two will come up, but for the most part, you're locked in. Um, so I, 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 I enjoy that. For me, there had to have been a better way to do combat. But you can also see how their, the complicated combat does make things very interesting and very intense. And so, I don't know, I'm left feeling very conflicted about this. 
just because of my situation, I play mostly with non-gamers, like really just family and friends who indulge me in the hobby. I would never pull this game out with them. Ever. I don't think. There's nobody that I play with right now that I would play this game with. That's not to say that my group might not grow, but in my personal group where it's just light gamers, no way this would never come near the table. I've got to check out the solo mode because I mentioned earlier that this video took me over two weeks to, well, not over two weeks, a week and a half to film. A couple of reasons for that. Number one, it's a beast. It took a ton of learning. Um, it's a long, it's a long game. This first game took a long time. So that was problematic. Tons of looking up the rules as I was recording, trying to grab my head around stuff. And I got a little bit bored in the middle. So in these rounds right over here, I was just bored. And I kept finding ways to fill my time that wasn't finishing this video with these rounds right here. Like I think the beginning is pretty interesting, but when you're on, like until the timer runs out, I did feel in this specific playthrough, and it's the only one I played, I was a little bit bored and I couldn't bring myself back to just finish the recording. But as things started churning there at the end, like I did think that one round was really fun early on where it was like, oh, you have to stop them from winning. Like once somebody is on the cusp of winning and you're trying to stop them while also maintaining your own thing, like that to me was interesting. But the in-between where nobody really had a win in sight, not even the chancellor because it was too early, I was a little bit bored. But yeah, I think right now I'm mad that I don't have another gamer to play with because I want to see what would happen in game two and how things evolve and change and new cards and new sites. So I don't know. I, I'm in a place where I could not rate how this game went. I would have to have several more plays to fill to figure out how I really feel and I don't know that that's going to really happen. This is one that I would love to play at a con. So I don't know when cons are happening again or when I'm going to get back to a con, but that's that's kind of my thoughts. But having said that, I'm going to go ahead and end this video so that I can go ahead and record the video where I show you how to clean this up in a way that will help you set up the next game. So I'm going to do a cleanup of this game. And even though I'm not playing a second round necessarily, I will go ahead and show you how it would be set up. I hope that was entertaining for you. If you notice mistakes, of course, let me know. What are your thoughts on Oath? Have you played it? What did you think of this video? All that crap. Leave me a comment. I will talk to you later. Have a good day. Bye.